Welcome everyone to the second Zoom Halifax Centre webinar uh, hosted here. Uh, we're really excited about this one because we have a very special guest that we'll introduce in a moment. Um, there are seven panelists here with us today. Um, Dave Chapman, you can see by his zodiacal light that's there. He'll be here momentarily. Um, Paul Gray, um, wave his hand. Um, he's here and he's our vice president. Um, Jerry, um, I'm here. Black, uh, my famous <laughs> husband. Um, Larry McDonald. Uh, these two gentlemen are Astro Imagers uh, presenting today. Uh, Wayne is our librarian. He is here today. And our very special guest, Phil Groff, who's the executive director at National. We'll hear from him later. We're really excited about that. <laughs> um, so there are a couple of things uh, I want to note. Uh, and I'm going to share my screen and see if I can get the agenda up here with uh, you folks. Um, and let's see if I can get this up to 200 so everyone can see it all right. Oh, too high. There we are there. So that's our agenda for today. Uh, following the welcome and introductions, Paul will be um, showing us a photo montage of photos that have been collected over the past month. Um, I'll be giving two in a row. One is news from the board and the second one is the weather resources on the internet. Uh, the Observer's Handbook presentation is one that we have every month with a different speaker addressing a different chapter on the uh, handbook. Uh, that'll be followed by Jerry and Blair doing their part three of their anatomy of an imaging system. What toys do you need? And I believe Jerry, you're doing something with Raspberry Pi today. And then we have our very special presentation with Phil about the welcome from the national office or everything you wanted to know about RASP but we're afraid to ask. Uh, for members that have been attending these meetings for a long time, you'll notice that Paul Heath is not included on the agenda. Uh, poor Paul has been having some technological challenges at home with his computer, so he won't be joining us today, unfortunately. Um, so, having said that, there were a couple of things I'd like to say about the webinar. Um, basically, because the um, attendees are muted. In other words, you can't speak directly uh, to the panelists. Um, there are a couple of ways in which you can ask questions. If you put your cursor at the bottom or even anywhere on your screen, you'll see at the bottom there's chat and there's uh, Q&A. You can access uh, the panelists at any point during the presentations by utilizing those two buttons, questioning or making comments in, in the chat. Um, and that can be done at any point. Certainly at the end of each presentation, there will be an opportunity uh, to ask questions, but you can certainly ask throughout. Um, there is no social time. Uh, Pat Kelly won't be delivering uh, snacks to us wherever we are. Sorry, folks. And for our guests, uh, we'd like to welcome you to, um, uh, to our RASP Halifax Center meeting and certainly uh, strongly encourage you to join RASP. Um, there are lots of perks for joining. Um, such as if you join RASC, or not if, but when you join RASC, you get a copy of, and I'm going to take off my uh, background because it interferes. The Observer's Handbook. This is the latest edition that you would get uh, every time uh, when you join, you get your copy, and this comes in every year. Uh, it's been produced since 1907, I believe. Thank you, Phil, for nodding. <laughs> um, you also get, uh, six times a year, the um, RASC Sky News. So you, and this is the latest edition, I do believe. Nope, that was the second last edition. Here's the latest one. <laughs> Sky News, uh, focus on the future. You also get, uh, you can choose whether electronically or hard copy. And this, I apologize, this is not the latest version. Um, because I don't know how, but we managed not to subscribe to the hard copy for the past year. So this is an older version, but you get the idea. This is a, a journal that um, has all sorts of neat and wonderful information in it. 
Um, you also get access to special presentations and webinars that RASC puts on that uh, the members of the general public may not get. Um, and from our center, uh, you get access to our St. Croix Observatory, uh, which non-members would not have access to. You also get access to our library, uh, when, uh, either um, by requesting it directly through uh, Wayne on site, on the uh, website, or when we actually do get to meet face to face, it will be a physical press cart that's rolled out and you can actually see the uh, stuff that's on it. Um, and plus our, our special presentations and meetings that we hold. Uh, how do you, and most importantly, you get access to an amazing group of uh, professional and amateur astronomers from not only here in our center, but also across the country. Um, and it's just an incredible group of folk that offer all sorts of um, help and assistance when needed. So how can you join? We'll deal with that later, I promise. Um, but for now, uh, because of the experience that we had with a, a um, another uh, webinar that we held, I want to wish happy birthday to everyone that's having a birthday today or at any point throughout the month until our next meeting on June 13. Um, salutations and congratulations on another successful circumnavigation of the Earth, of the Sun. <laughs> We're not circumnavigating the Earth these days. So, Paul, um, are you able to put up the photo montage? Just, hey, thanks, Judy. Just bear with me one second and I'll share my screen and bring up the uh, slideshow. Sure. Let me know. Is that working? Everybody seeing it? Some of you see it? Good. All right, we'll go. I'm not going to say too much. I'm just going to let it roll through. Um, why is it not going? There we go. All right. Do I need to narrate these? I feel real awkward narrating people's pictures. Your choice. It, it was another decent month of uh, observing, I think. There was more clear nights during the moon than there was without the moon, but uh, there was a fair amount of activity. A number of our members were out shooting both the moon and some deep sky objects, so we were a bit lucky that way for for April. It's one of the better Aprils I remember in a number of years. I think I had five or six nights, so uh, can't complain too much. Background noise was my son Connor just joining me in the chair beside me. So, very nice work by Fabian there. That's a beautiful shot of a full moon, very well processed to bring up the colors of the seas. Mm. Mike Boss shot shooting through his windows of his apartment again. Guy's got uh, pretty good stuff over the last couple of years for where, where he's from. As usual, it's always clearest around full moon, as you can tell by a lot of the full moon shots in this uh, montage today. Roy Bishop shot this shot of Venus with his old refractor, an old Brandon uh, refractor that he has. Bruce Melody and their, their lovely view down there on the, up on the mountain. Good shot of the earth shine by Mike Boscha. I reprocessed some old work of M81 and M82. Tony Shellenick sketches. Enough, I, I can't say enough about them. Just check them out. It's great. David Hoskins testing out his new camera that he got a few months ago there on the moon, uh, the Valley Alps region, uh, right through here. And really in a couple spots, you can even see the real in the middle of the valley, which is really, really exceptional. I think that was interesting because of the mountains on the left that are just yeah, showing up. Peak showing up. Yeah. 
the wonderful pass of Starlink satellites we had last week. Mike Bosch, I've got a neat one there, and you can actually tell that the train has got thickness to it. There was actually multiple paths that they were traveling on, not all on the same trajectory anymore. And that's it. So I'm done. <laughs> Stop share, and I'll give it back to you, Judy. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Um, so next up is Dave Chapman. And to address, what's up? Dave, we're not hearing you. Second. I've unmuted you. Now try. How's about that? Uh, 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 yes, well, thanks again for inviting me back to do What's Up this month. Um, uh, how do we, we have a poll. I want to ask some questions. How do we do that, Judy? Uh, I can set it up here. Do you want me to start that now for you? Um, well, are you ready to? I can do it momentarily. Okay. Yep. Just, let, just let me say a few words. Sure. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so for the benefit of the people that are joining us for the first time, and that includes you, Phil, uh, welcome. So every, I'm the chair of the observing committee of RSC Halifax, and every month I prepare a What's Up PowerPoint, and I present it at center meetings uh, like this or in person. And I also, we also post it on our RSC Halifax webpage for all to see. So it's a, a PDF form on the web page, and all of the links that are in the um, presentation, all the URL links are active. So you, after the presentation today, if you want to go back and review it, you can go back and review it and follow all the links. I may not follow them all today, um, just in the interest of time. Uh, every month, I throw up a few observing challenges just to kind of focus people's attention on particular events. And so I asked Judy this time around if she could create a poll. And I would like people, if they would like to participate, uh, it's completely anonymous. Um, but I, I'm going to ask Judy to put up the poll with the challenge objects on it. So please, if you're participating, just click if you saw any of the things that are on the list. And I think that there's a couple of write-in spots as well, isn't there, Judy, for people to write things in, I thought. Maybe uh, not. I'm not. I don't think so, but there are multiple choices. I, okay. it's, it, you, you can click more than one box, let's put it that way. Let, let, let's okay. give this a try. Uh, but why don't you throw that up and we can get people to um, uh, do the poll. Does, everybody, does everyone see that? Okay, so how about people, uh, if they did any of those things or not, can you click one of the boxes? Or more. <laughs> or more, yes, more. So I'm not seeing, uh, maybe Judy, maybe you can see progress. I can. Uh, so um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say that, um, uh, I, I'm gonna say that I saw the uh, coma star cluster. Well, I got the number wrong. It's Malot one one one. Anyway, I'm gonna. So I'm submitting. I'm submitting one here. All right. So we got. We are accumulating a few votes. We are. We've gotten okay. 22, 23 of the thirty-two so okay. far. Twenty-five. Wow. We'll, we'll give them um, just a few more seconds. Five more seconds here, and then we'll end the poll. Yeah. Can you? Yeah, that's fine. It's just. It's just a fun thing. I'd just be interested to know how many people did what. Um, so okay, you can share yeah. that. You can share that with us. I can. Twenty-four percent no. Yeah, three lunar craters, lunar seas. Good. Venus in the Pleiades. Wow, a, a high number of people saw the conjunction of Mars and Saturn. I'm impressed. Okay, I'm very pleased at the participation there. Uh, so that's percentage of respondents, I guess. Yes. So there may be people who didn't, and they're just not even saying so. <laughs> well, we had um, twenty over like twenty-seven respondents. At least the last I saw. Okay, that's pretty. That's um, pretty high. Well, okay. actually, twenty-five. There are twenty-five respondents. Well, well, the, uh, I, I, so that's good. 
um, thanks uh, everybody for for doing that. I I think we'll do that ag again because it's it's a nice way to uh, just find out whether people are uh, following the events and um, uh, whether it's even you know I sometimes wonder if it's even worth putting out those challenges. But based on what I've seen, I think it's worth doing. So uh, so having said that, I'm going to share my screen and get on with the presentation, which is here. All right, are you seeing my presentation? Yes. Okay, what's up? May the 1st to the 31st. Made with the RSE Observer's Handbook and Sky Safari. That's my favorite um, planetarium software, if you like. Okay, so, um, the sun this month, there's there's numbers there, and then there's the the um, the, the graphics. So we're obviously we're well past. Um, in fact, we're halfway between the spring equinox and the summer solstice. So there's a fair bit of daylight now, and the nights are getting fairly short. Um, so the, we only have between about six hours and um, sorry four hours. Uh, six hours and four hours of dark of true darkness to do observing so and it's going to get worse in june <laughs> um but for the gardeners amongst us which which i count myself as one uh there's a lot of sunlight there's 14 to 15 hours of sunlight for growing things so um uh, i'm not going to follow today's solar activity i think there may be a couple of um sunspots there but nothing to write home about but if you want to go to the website the Halifax Center website uh, afterwards you could follow that link and it takes you to all of the information about the sun um, these graphics at the bottom here showing the pie chart of daylight nighttime and dusk I, I generated those um, using a, a soft computer software I have called Mathematica and I create those for every uh, month and there's a link at the bottom right uh, I made a little movie if you want to see how it varies through through the year you can go to that YouTube um, video it's only a couple of minutes long uh, you, but it might be fun for you to look at that um, all right one other thing I'd like to say about the Sun this month uh, you know you notice that noon takes place at at uh, 11 or 1 12 p.m. Uh, so people might be wondering, you know, isn't noon at 12 o'clock? And the answer is yes, uh, it is by the clock. But if we're talking about solar noon, there's two factors which, well, there's actually three factors which affect that. First of all, uh, it's basically an hour late because we're on daylight uh, saving time. Uh, so that's why it's one instead of 12. There's an, the other reason that it's a, a little different from right on the hour is that um, when you use standard time, it's only, e it's only equivalent to the true solar time at one meridian. And if you're left or if sort of west or east of that meridian, you're, 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 it's going to be delayed or advanced by a few minutes. And that's in the handbook. I can't remember what page it's on, but if you're interpreting sundials, it tells you what the correction is. And the third reason is that the sun is not a very good clock. Um, it goes around the earth, uh, it goes around the sky roughly, well, it goes around once every year, but the speed at which it goes around in right ascension, it varies for two reasons. One is because the ecliptic is tilted. And the other reason is that the uh, Earth's orbit is elliptical, so the speed of the sun along the ecliptic actually changes. So for those two reasons, um, that's another correction to the time. And I should have got written down these names, but there's a, a page in the handbook which um, shows this diagram called the analemma, which shows you when the sun is fast and then when the sun is slow. So that's, that's why noon is not at 12 o'clock. Um, all right, the moon. The, the moon, the full moon this month is um, on May 7th. It's coming up. Uh, so uh, uh, people who follow the moon will see that every month 
the mo full moon gets a little bit closer to the beginning. And that is because our Gregorian months are 30 or 31 days long, or sometimes 28 or 29 in the case of February. The synodic period of the moon is only 29 and a half days. So uh, it comes a little bit earlier every month. It comes a little bit earlier in the month. And then, uh, um, and that's, that's different every year. So um, the full moon this month in, in Mi'kma'ki, the, in, it's called the frog's croaking moon. And I'm just gonna play this uh, um, language uh, video for the sake of uh, people who haven't seen it. So um, that, that set of videos was uh, completed last year. Um, I don't uh, think we switched uh, to your video. Oh, you didn't see it? No, because uh, you, I think you have your PowerPoint as, as full screen. Uh, okay, sorry about that. So you only heard the audio? We didn't hear anything. I didn't hear anything. Oh, I'm sorry. Should I try to do that again? I'm sorry about that. Thank, if, thanks for pointing that out. Um, if, if you go back to your desktop, you might. Yeah, we're still learning about this software, aren't we? Um, go back to my desktop. Oh, I have to escape from this thing. That's what I have to do, yeah. Um, I'm sorry. I'm having trouble. Maybe I have to stop my share and start the share again. Mm -hmm. yeah, there. There we go. That's good. Good, thanks. But very quiet. There's no sound coming through, Dave. Sorry. Okay. Well, we're going to have volume to. Volume up, Dave. There's one it, it, it is. We'll have to test that out next month before we do that again. I really apologize. Yeah. When you when you share your screen to share a a, a video or share your PowerPoint, it's going to have a video embedded in it. There's a little checkbox as you're doing. All right. That said, share computer audio, and if you click that, that's how you get that sent out to us. Um, who said that? Is that Phil? That's me. Yeah, I actually missed that because there was something making a noise in my ear, which was another frog. Um, could you repeat that, please? <laughs> when you go to share, yes, there's a checkbox you'll see in the in the lower corner of the sharing screen that says "Share Computer Audio." Yeah. Oh. You click that. That then pushes through the audio from your videos. Too. Okay. Thanks. So anyway, Judy, next month when we do this, I would like to do a dry run of this so that we don't get messed up in the meeting, okay? Oh boy. All right, you learn something every month, I guess. Um, now. I apologies. Okay. Dave, just so you know, a couple of us have noted now that the analemma is found in the observer's handbook on pages 184 to 185. All right. I'm having a hard time getting back to my PowerPoint. Oh, there it is. There's so many things going on. I really apologize, folks. Uh, we, ha we had this more or less figured out last, year, last month and I seem to have forgotten everything that I've learned. <laughs> okay, where were we? Uh, I'll try to speed up. To <laughs> so on May 12th, there's gonna be a nice little uh, uh, conjunction of the moon and Jap Jupiter and Saturn before dawn. 
uh, which unfortunately means you have to get up at about 4.30 because dawn is so early. Um, but if, for those who do rise early, uh, you should be able to see that. Uh, maybe you don't have to be up as early as that, but if you want to see Saturn, Saturn's not quite as bright. Last quarter is on the 14th of May. The day after that, there's uh, the moon and the Mars. Moon and Mars have a little conjunction. The next new moon is on May 22nd, and uh, that will be the trees fully leafed moon time, Nipnigus. Um, May 23rd, in the evening sky, there's m the moon, Venus, and Mercury. And that's, that's the first challenge. Um, it is not a 24, less than 24 hour moon, but it is a young moon. And it is a bit of a challenge because Mercury and Venus are low in the twilight. Uh, but it, it would be worth trying to see it. And it might be a photo op for those people who do wide field photography. And the first quarter, the next first quarter is on May the 30th. So the challenge there is to look for the moon, Venus and Mercury. A lot of people haven't seen the planet Mercury. So when you have these little conjunctions, it kind of helps to have the moon and then Venus handy so that you can, you know, find them first and then look for Mercury. Uh, as always, there's, this is the moon as it's uh, depicted in the Explore the Universe program. It's a, a short list of 12 craters and 12 mare. So um, for those people who are doing Explore the Universe, uh, these are where the, um, uh, this is, um, this map is in the Explore the Universe guidebook that we publish, RESC publishes. That's the only place that map appears other than my PowerPoint. <laughs> so the uh, challenge, the second challenge is to observe three each of those in, in binoculars. They're all basically binocular objects. Now the planets get quite busy. At the moment, Mercury is behind the sun, but later in the month, as we said, it's gonna be in conjunction with Venus and then near the moon uh, around the 21st, 22nd, 23rd and 24th. Mercury moves quite quickly. So, you know, its circumstances at the beginning of the month can be quite different from later in the month. Um, so uh, there's, oops, there's a, a little picture there with a five degree circle, which would be typic a typical binocular field, uh, Mercury in conjunction with Venus. Um, um, so that's another challenge, just to try to do that on the 21st and the 22nd. Um, Venus, very interesting this month. It's still quite bright. This is the last month it's going to be in the evening sky. Um, it, uh, it had its maximum brightness, it had its elongation. But now it's moving very quickly towards the sun at sunset. Uh, every day it gets closer to the sun, gets closer to us. Uh, as we said before, it's near the moon on the 23rd. But at, at the beginning of the month, it's 24% illuminated and it's a minus 4.5 magnitude and it sets a full three and a half hours after the sun. But on May 31st, it's 0.3% illumination, a little dimmer, and it sets half an hour after the sun. Uh, and the reason that is it's heading towards an inferior conjunction on June, I'm gonna say 6th or 7th. Uh, and it's gonna be a very close inferior conjunction. Eight years ago, and Venus has an eight year cycle in the sky, eight years ago on June 6th and 7th, depending on where you were in the earth, there was the transit of Venus and it actually passed in front of the sun at inferior conjunction. This one's eight years later and it's a very close uh, in, uh, inferior conjunction, but it will be many, many years before it passes over the sun at an inferior conjunction. So. The, the challenge here is quite easy, actually. It's just to go out every few days and just pick up um, Venus in your binoculars and see uh, the crescent and see how the crescent is growing in size and getting thinner as, as Venus approaches us and gets closer to the sun in the sky. Uh, that's a fun thing to do. Mars is in the morning sky. It's a magnitude zero by the end of the month. It's still got a, fall, a fairly small disk, so you'll need a, a good telescope to see that. In about a month or two, it might be worth starting to image Mars or look at Mars because you'll start to see some features on the, on the surface 
uh, I, as I said before, it's near the moon on the 15th. Um, of course, Mars is heading towards a uh, pretty good opposition in October of this year. So it's going to get better and better uh, through the rest of the spring and the summer. And it'll move more into the evening sky. Uh, it still needs, you still need to get up in the morning to see it. Jupiter and Saturn uh, are visible in the dawn sky. Um, and of course, there's that conjunction with the gibbous moon that uh, is a challenge. Um, for those that are keeners, uh, I mean, Jupiter in a telescope is a beautiful object. Uh, it's moving closer to opposition. And I can't remember the date, it's in the handbook, but there's a double, there's a double shadow transit, but I didn't include it because I think it's during the twilight hours here. So I wasn't quite sure if that was something we were gonna be able to see here in this time zone, but um, maybe um, farther west, uh, it might be darker and it might be a better view there. And just forget about Uranus and Neptune. They're, they're not visible. They're, they're lost in the sun's glare. So that's going on, what's going on with the planets. Uh, the next thing of interest is Comet Atlas. Uh, we've been following that quite a bit. Um, it's, it's still, it's, it's, again, it's the last chance. By, by the middle of the month, it's, it's gonna be very low in the Northeast and we're not gonna be able to see it very well with any kind of optics. It has not turned out to be the brilliant object everyone hoped. It underwent a, um, a bit of a breakdown, I think around the 19th of, uh, uh, 19th of April. Uh, Dave Lane took a number of pictures over a few nights and created this uh, image. One of the frames, and one of the frames of this image, you can see that it's broken up into a whole bunch of bits. And, uh, and they, they've kind of wandered off. I noticed in Sky Safari that all of those bits have now have independent um, orbital parameters. They, they're calling it Comet <laughs> C2019Y4, A, B, C, and D at least, maybe even E. So they're all considered separate objects now. So it's the last chance. It's not going to be spectacular. Famous last words. You will need a telescope. If you have a dark sky, you might be able to pick it up, but uh, it has not been uh, much of a binocular object. Um, there may be some, there may be some comets coming along. People are getting excited about, about common, Comet Swan, but it's not going to be very easy to see in the Northern Hemisphere. We might, we might be able to see it, but it's going to be pretty low in the northern, on the northern horizon. So you're going to have to be, you'll be lucky to see it. Um, this is the last, I'm going to say this is the last uh, of the spring constellations. Next month we'll move to uh, the summers. So in the Explore the Universe, there are, these are the, um, con the constellations in Explore the Universe for spring, Ursa Minor, Ursa Major, Bootes, Leo, Virgo, and Libra. Um, so if you're, if you're doing that program, you should be able to see all those from the city. I don't remember, you only need 12 constellations in all to get it. So, um, and as for, for stars, here are the stars, Polaris, Co Cochab, Dubai, and Merak, easy. They're the pointers of the Big Dipper. Arcturus, not hard to find, Denebola and Regulus, Spica in Virgo, and uh, I always have trouble with these ones, Zubanel Ganubi and Zubanel, Zuban, I think I might have left out an L, Zubanel Shamali. They're, at one time they were the claws of Scorpius, but somehow Scorpius got broken up into Scorpius and Libra which makes you wonder what they did for Zodiac constellations back then. So that's a, like a homework assignment, I guess, for somebody. Um, as far as deep sky is concerned, there's tons of deep sky objects in the spring sky, but you know, it's like 99.9% .9 of them are galaxies. So they're quite dim and you, need, you definitely need a telescope to see them. Uh, so in terms of binocular type objects, uh, there's really only three in the Explore the Universe there's a, the beehive, which is an open cluster. Uh, maybe, maybe a little bit hard to, it may be setting in the evening now, but if you, if you get out when it first gets dark, you should be able to pick out the beehive. 
Um, the moon was there a couple of nights ago. So yeah, you should be able to pick out the beehive with binoculars. And then there's a globular cluster M5 in, I don't know if that's serpents or boutes, but it's over there. Uh, the one that I ask people to look for is the coma cluster in coma berenices. Uh, it's one of, it's a very close by cluster. It's only a few hundred light years away. And, it, and that for that reason, it's quite spread out in the sky. And you really, it really is a binocular object. It's very difficult to capture it in a telescope. So uh, that's, that's the challenge object. Um, um, and it, inc it includes a double star that's also in the Explore the Universe. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of galaxies. People are imaging galaxies, the people who are doing astro imaging. Um, uh, not easy to pick up in binoculars. But if you have a telescope, you could try. Uh, just before we go, uh, a lot of us were, were following Betelgeuse, uh, Alpha Orionis. Uh, it dimmed a little bit after Christmas or just before Christmas started to dim. Everyone got excited, thought it was going to turn into a supernova. And then it um, bottomed out there around the beginning of February and started uh, getting bright again. It's almost back to its full brightness. These data points here I took from the American Association of Amateur AA Variable Star Observers. Uh, American Association of Variable Star Observers, right? These data points here, I, I, there's, there's a ton of data points. These are the ones from Canada RESC. I went through and picked out the observers that identified as RESC in Canadian. So there's some visual observations in there. There's the, 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 the orange, uh, sorry, the green squares are mostly Dave Lane using um, photometry. And I guess he's using his telescope at Abbey Ridge. Um, and because it's my presentation, I put mine in brown so that they stand out. So those are my personal observations. Uh, that I contributed to AAVSO. Uh, I'm not uh, a stalwart um, variable star observer, but I, um, I feel like I did pretty good compared to everyone else. Uh, and, and I swear that I estimated my magnitudes before I looked at anyone else's. You have to take my word for that. I thought I was doing pretty good. You could get it within, uh, you can get it within a, t a tenth of a magnitude. Some people say they can do it um, more closely than that, but you can see there's quite a scatter. So anyway, so uh, maybe at this point, but the sum that there's no supernova, but it was fun anyway to watch it dim. I don't think I've ever uh, experienced that before. And that's the end of my presentation. So if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. I'm not hearing anything. Oh, there you go. Um, so far, there haven't been any questions. Um, comment from Tim, good stuff. Oh, somebody's asking me how you measure magnitude. Uh, uh, yes, I haven't okay. got to that one yet. Yes, how do you measure yeah. magnitude? Well, strictly speaking, you measure magnitude with some sort of electro-optic device in your telescope. That's a measurement. Some, So you take a picture and you 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 look at the light that's um, the thing that you're interested in, you compare it with the, the light from the stars that are standards and you do some data processing and some kind of interpolation. And that's a measurement of the magnitude. Um, visually, I wouldn't say it's a measurement so much. I guess we would, it's an estimate, visual estimate, but you do the same thing. You, you have a, a, a chart of stars which have known magnitudes, usually uh, usually uh, specified to the local tenth of the magnitude, and you look at the star of interest, and you look at you compare it to other stars that are nearby, and you go back and forth, and you sort of you find a few stars that, that are a couple that are a little brighter than the one of interest, and the one that's a couple that are a little lower, and then you 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 guess you guess what, you know how far between. Uh, sort of the, the nearest brightness stars, like how far the star of interest is. Is it in between? Is it closer to one than another? 
and it's kind of a skill you have to develop over over a period of time. It doesn't take that long. I don't know if anyone else wants to comment. Anyway, uh, that's how it's done. Um, but having said that, um, when you look at the the estimates that people hand in, they're all over the map. I mean, people, you look at the data, it's all over the map. There's also an added complication that Betelgeuse is very red. And when you c compare a red star to a non-red star, there's, um, because it's not the same color, uh, there, there's an error associated with that that I, I don't want to talk about. Um, I've had arguments with people. Yeah. I put down I put down what I think it looks like, and I think that's honest, you know. And then people say, "Well, no, that's not really that because of the such and such." I just I'm just putting down what I see. That's what I see. You can interpret it any way you want. <laughs> and, and as you and I both know, Dave, two people could be staring at the same thing and see them very differently. Yes, in fact, you're not supposed to stare at the star. That's that's, that's right. That's the mistake. If you stare yeah. at it, you get the wrong answer. So that's right. To, it's uh, it's a yeah, it's a bit schizophrenic. You have to sort of like you know. It's like you have to look at it, but not look at it. It's, uh, anyway, it's fun. You should try it. Okay, I'm, I'm through. Thanks very much. Thanks so much for that, Dave. Uh, so I have made note of the mm -hmm. seven challenges that you presented. Oh, uh, just a moment, Paul. I, I will acknowledge you in a moment. Okay. Um, I think this time, because I, I picked them out, I'll verify it with you that these are the seven that you really wanted us to see over the coming month, and uh, we'll post it on the announce list. So that way members will have a chance uh, here at the center to, uh, to view them and to uh, participate in that challenge. So, so Paul, you had something to... Uh, I just wanted to add a challenge onto the Venus uh, segment that Dave Chapman talked about there. There's, um, the roots of this go back to the 1990s and actually an article that was written in the RAC Bulletin at the time, I believe it was Doug Pitcairn. Pat Kelly, you could probably confirm this or not, but I think it was Doug Pitcairn it started and that was a challenge to observe the disk of Jupiter with the unaided eye. Uh, the problem with observing Jupiter is Jupiter's round and it's often seen in the dark sky so you have a very hard contrast. Uh, every few years when Venus is getting close to the sun in the evening sky like this time now, the physical size of the disk of Jupiter visibly is going to be over 50 arc seconds for about a week before conjunction. Uh, so around May 15th, May 24th in that time period, uh, the disk of Venus is actually big enough for those who have young eyes or keen eyes or good glasses to possibly see actual size and shape to it. And the advantage to doing it with Venus over Jupiter is when it's at this phase, it's only about 10% or less illuminated. So you're not seeing a disk, but you can actually see that it's more elongated than round. And, and uh, it's kind of a challenge to to say you were actually able to see the disk of a planet without any optical aid. And it only happens every couple of years when it's close to the sun, or you got to get up early in the morning and see it in the first five or six days after it's coming out from the sun. So I just want to throw that out there for anybody who wants to give that a try in May. Um, love to hear from you if you do. That, thanks for that, Paul. Uh, on page 211 of the handbook, there's a nice diagram that I got Mike Gatto to draw, which shows the... Uh, Si relative sizes of the planets, and it includes Venus at, at its closest approach and um, and its farthest approach. So, yeah, it's it gets it gets to be about sixty six seconds of arc, which is getting really close to what the eye can can pick out. So, um, yeah, I can definitely say when I look at planets, they never look round. <laughs> Okay. Well, thank you. Um, up next is moi. Uh, in fact, up the next two is, is me in a row. Uh, my first presentation will be news from the board. That'll be this board our, our, from our center. And then, um, as many of you know, every month we do present um, a chapter of the Observer's Handbook. And um, we'll get into that following the news from the board. So I just have to share my screen here for a moment. Oops, wrong one. Try this one, it works better. Can everyone see that? Okay. Um, this is 
our COVID update uh, from our center. Um, if you want to find us online, um, it's halifax.rasp.ca and uh, it's everything you ever want to know about us. Um, as many of you know, we now participate in many levels uh, using Zoom. Our members meeting uh, are held on webinar and they are through the national RASC account, um, Zoom account versus our meetings here at the center, which are, we now have acquired our own Zoom account to hold our meetings for our board. You'll note the couple of dates that are there as well as our committee meetings. And so far the Novi East Planning Committee well, we had one last weekend and we'll be having one this coming weekend. We have offered virtual observing sessions, uh, lunar observing. In fact, there was one on uh, Tuesday evening and um, also DSO observing and astro imaging processing. And, and of course we have, there was one last night, which we'll get into in a moment. Um, so those are four members. We also have a, a YouTube channel here for the center, and here's all the videos that we currently have uh, posted to the video segment of our um, site. Uh, and if you'll notice, this one right here, that was last night's presentation. Um, so thank you to Jeff Donaldson for um, presenting that last evening and for Jerry for getting it up and posted. Uh, Explore the Moon, that was Dave and um, Blair, who, who did that one uh, on Tuesday evening, and of course all the others that are there that you can see from times past. So if you missed something, including even our last month's uh, members meeting, uh, you can certainly go to our YouTube site, and all you have to do is uh, go onto YouTube and search for RAS Califax and you'll find us. Uh, one thing I did want to put, a couple things I wanted to point out. Um, one of the things we'll be starting to do is when we do special presentations, and you'll note here, uh, this is the Explore the Moon session that was done on Tuesday. Um, when Dave was talking about the various lunar features, we've listed them and the time on the video is now listed there as well. So if you wanted specifically, for instance, to go to Halley, you could then click on that 27 minutes, 24 seconds, and it would take you right to that particular segment if you're interested in doing that. We also had two special guests on that evening, uh, Kathy LeBlanc and Alan Dyer uh, popped in. And the other feature that I'm not sure everyone was aware of, because uh, I certainly wasn't until uh, yesterday or this morning, um, you know, I saw the letters there but really didn't click in, is the closed caption. And I've, I had clicked on it so that you could see the fact that um, you can actually get closed captioning up and functioning. So for those members that have friends who are hearing impaired or members who are hearing impaired, um, if they click on that, they'll be able to see as well as read what's uh, being said. And just to note that it doesn't necessarily capture words exactly, but pretty close, most times. Um, a notification regarding our star party. Um, certainly, uh, it was planned for the nights of August 21 to 23 at Smiley's Provincial Park. However, COVID-19 has certainly changed some of the plans for our star party. Um, it is canceled as a camping event, and I do want to specify it's as a camping event. Uh, the Nova East Committee will be meeting next weekend to discuss how we can best utilize the speakers that were um, confirmed for the site, uh, for the event rather. Uh, so as upsetting as it is that we're not gonna be at Smiley's this year, um, just wanted you to know, although we won't be in the park, it will still be Smiley. Okay, so we will keep you apprised as to what's going on there. Um, this is a segment that I've just started up. It's called Stars of the RAS Califax Center. This allows us to brag a bit about our members and the achievements uh, that they've accomplished in terms of publications and um, whatnot. Um, first up is Michael Boschat. Uh, he was featured in Cindy Day's um, article in the newspaper. Um, was it, what is it? Uh, anyway on April 25th, and it features her introduction to Michael and all the things that he's achieved in these years as a, um, a solar and um, nighttime observer, and the fact that their schedules, uh, she did mention that Michael, as most of us know, sleeps uh, at, uh, in the day and, uh, sorry, sleeps at night and observes during the day. Another one that I'd like to mention is Barry Burgess. Barry's photographs are absolutely phenomenal. 
and he was uh, highlighted two months in a row in astronomy. Um, the photo labeled Burr is actually a composite of 11 shots that he put together uh, of the Milky Way over this lake at Kuchipquak uh, Park. And the other one, uh, Dawn's Early Light, shows the um, zodiacal light uh, outside of Lockport. So kudos to, to Barry on those two phenomenal uh, photographs. And also Dave Hoskin um, had a, a feature in um, Reader's Digest, Our Canada. Uh, and his article was How I Fell in Love with Stargazing. I've only included a couple of his photographs that are there, but it's uh, I think a six page article um, written by Dave uh, about how um, he got involved in, and stays involved in astronomy. So kudos to all those folks for the work well done. Um, Halifax Center has entered into a, a partnership with the Discovery Center in, in which we um, assist with events that they organize um, related to astronomy, of course. Uh, the latest one was the Discovery Days uh, space, springtime stargazing. This was an event that we had hoped initially would be actually held at the site and would be held uh, during the day, early evening. Um, and it was, this particular event was hosted by uh, their theater presentation, Japna, and I apologize for mispronouncing our last name, Sudhu Barar. Uh, and it was held on April 26th, and there were, some of our members were involved in this. Uh, Jennifer and John Reed uh, did a three minute video on 50 animals that have been to space. Um, we were lucky enough that I believe in the February meeting, face-to-face uh, -face meeting that we had, John and Jennifer did a, a presentation about the book that they co-wrote. Um, and as well, Tony Schelling, uh, the man we affectionately refer to as Doc Binoc, um, did a wonderful 10 minute video on um, binoculars and it's a really good introduction to how to use binoculars, what to look for in terms of selecting them, um, and what they what you can hope to see with it. So it's worth watching uh, if you're interested in uh, binocular viewing. And as you know, we all recommend that when people start astronomy, that that's where they start is with a pair of binoculars versus a telescope. Get to know the night sky. So if you want to join RASC, as I said earlier, remember all those wonderful perks that we talked about? Well, uh, first of all, you go to our website, which is halifax.rasc.ca, and you go into a menu item called About Us, and you'll get this uh, column showing on that page about becoming a member. Now, when you become a member, you actually become a member of RASC Canada as a whole. You then select which center you want to join. So you can join online by clicking on that word join. It'll take you to the national website and their form to fill in uh, to join. But if you're old school and you prefer a paper copy uh, to send in, then you can mail on the word form and it'll take you to the form in which you can do that as well. So your choice, but we do recommend it, uh, strongly suggest that you, you uh, join us if you haven't already. Um, what's happening next month? Well, um, certainly we'll be holding our meeting again by webinar on Zoom. Uh, we have basically the um, same agenda uh, hopefully, Paul will be able to join us for his Food for the Soul and his youth presentation. And we're working to get to hear back from our special guest that we hope to have next month. We'll keep you posted. We should be, uh, be able to post that fairly shortly as to uh, who that is. Um, just a note that on June 6th, our meetings are usually held the first Saturday of the month, but not next month. Um, that weekend is what have been the GA, and there are some special presentations being held that weekend. So we've opted out of that one and we're holding our meeting the following Saturday. So just be aware of that. Uh, we'll certainly remind you um, about the meeting changes uh, and the fact that the following weekend is summer solstice. So kind of special. So any questions? Okay, well, um, I don't see any, so I'll, I'll go on. And um, the next segment is regarding the chapter in the Observer's Handbook. 
on weather resources on the internet. Now I will state straight up front, I am not an expert in this by any stretch of the imagination. Um, one of the things um, in listening to the, um, uh, what do you call it, the Observer's Handbook presentations that National has um, put up, um, one of the things they've suggested is the Observer's Handbook has a lot of information in it. Uh, some of it is easily understood. Other parts of it require some investigation by you as the reader. And I will confess, this is one of those instances where I had to do some further investigation in order to present this, so what I hope will be um, some form of logic, logical sequence. So, um, as it says there in the upper right, uh, it's from the Observer's Handbook. Uh, that's Weather Resources on the Internet. That's by Alan Rahill on pages 74 to 78. And one of the things that astronomers have to do is when is it good to go out and observe? Um, the, there was a movie called uh, the, um, the Aeronauts in which one of the characters, Amelia Wren, made the comment, look up, the sky is open. Well, the question is, is it? And when is it clear? And for how long? So, we know that uh, there have been specialized services for aviation, agriculture, forestry, and marine applications, but also in more recent years, quite a few years, um, because of interests of not only professional, but also amateur astronomers, there are also specialized services now for astronomers. And the one thing you have to keep in mind is that weather forecasts are accurate if made from uh, an inform informed source, right? Okay. So there's satellite images. Now the GOES-R series, there are two satellites that are geostationary above the Earth, which means that they are positioned at the same point and travel at the same speed at which the Earth is traveling so that uh, there are two GOES uh, satellite uh, featured on North America right now. One is the GOES East, which would be ours, and it covers from um, basically West Coast Africa to some point, and it goes through that particular position, goes through Baffin Island to Quebec and Eastern Ontario, and goes west, covers over the western side of the country plus the Pacific Ocean. There were six instrument suites aboard each of those satellites that do various things. Um, and what this means is that these particular uh, satellites do enhance the detection of various things as you can see there. Um, and of course the bottom one in the list is space weather. Well, why, why is space weather important to us? Well, I, as you know, we um, communications, transportation, electrical power systems can be disrupted and even damaged um, by space weather storms um, so that geomagnetic storms and other space weather phenomena pose a serious threat to all space operations and can result in total mission failures. We want to avoid that. But along with these two um, satellites, there's also POSE. So we got GOES and POSE and the polar orbiting ones, um, although um, they orbit the Earth uh, 14 times every day, because of their narrow swath, or path that, or view that they take of the polar region, uh, we only see that same point on that swath about every 12 hours. So there are three types of satellite images. A uh, question for you folks, are you seeing the Q&A piece on the lower right corner of your screens? We can, it may not be in the lower right. Okay, um, I'm going to get out of this and, and just for a moment, and except I haven't got a mouse. There we go. My mouse is dead. All right, we'll go forward as is. In any case, there are three types of, of uh, satellite images um, that we'll discuss. First is visible, 
keeping in mind that the visible one is only visible during the day because it's light, uh, the image is generated from light being uh, reflected from the sun. It will detect thunderstorms before radar. So when you're looking at a visible one, the clouds are obviously white, the ground is gray as you can see, uh, and the water is dark. Uh, and one thing I do want to note is that there is a corrected URL on page 74 of um, the Observer's Handbook. The one that's in there was incorrect, but uh, Phil assures me that the next um, printing of the, um, or not Phil, but uh, Edgar, James Edgar, um, assures me that that will be corrected in the next printing of, of the handbook. Then there's infrared. And this uses sensors to measure infrared emission to determine the temperature of clouds of the Earth. Um, everything on the Earth emits infrared of some variety. Um, so it's used to determine cloud heights and types, land and surface temperatures, uh, ocean surface temperatures. And keep in mind that the higher up in the atmosphere it is, it's going to be cooler. So the red and blue that you see in there along that bar, so you can compare what's in the image, um, it is um, oh yes, and this was, these were all taken on Tuesday, by the way, during our snowstorm, or the latter part of our snowstorm during the day. So that's what the images that you're seeing. Then there's the upper uh, level water vapor. And this uses wavelengths of which water vapor strongly emits and absorbs the infrared uh, radiation. Um, it does not track clouds. So what you're seeing here is not cloud cover, but the vapor, the water vapor that's in, in the atmosphere, usually at about 15 to 30,000 feet. And if you see a dark area like you do with the, excuse me, the darker gray area down there in the lower right, you can see from the color um, scheme there that that's where it's good transparency. So we then come to radar images and for your remote controlled observatories, either because you're sitting in your living room and it's in your backyard, or for those that are perhaps intercontinental, um, or, and for star parts, we wanna know is the precipitation coming and how quickly, and when do I need to take in um, my uh, scope, or when do I have to close the roof? Now keep in mind that Environment Canada has 31 sites uh, in most populated areas of Canada, with the detection range about 250 kilometers around each site. So about 95% of Canadians uh, would have that radar coverage. And radar echoes, the echoes that the radar detects, uh, tracks all forms of participation, that you, as you can see there. Um, Ellen suggests two websites, uh, the upper one being for uh, radar images for Canada, the second one in Wonderground, uh, for the US if you're interested in and these are in the these are in the observer handbook um, This was the radar image um, from uh, Tuesday at well it says 330 uh, our time uh, And interestingly enough um, The weather forecast that particular day had suggested two to four um, Centimeters of, of snow and we actually got 25 so it's just like but that that was an early forecast or the forecast that you see down there was actually an earlier in the day forecast. And one of the things that um, the best sites to go to for astronomy weather or forecasts is this one that he had suggested, which is the Government of Canada weather website and slash astro. And here you can see where uh, it provides some fairly good um, information about cloud forecasts, seeing forecasts, sky transparency, what about weather forecasts near the ground, and it even provides uh, the actual weather um, forecast for you as well as you can see the weather, uh, sorry, radar and satellite images. Now this is one of uh, the site for the, uh, the cloud cover. These were three images that I took off the, um, so when you click on the cloud forecast, you'll get that chart in the upper right and as you can see, it provides you uh, models based on various times and predictions so many hours out. Um, I took three shots, again, on this is the snowstorm Tuesday, um, showing you how the, the storm was traveling. And you can see by the time T20 was that some of the sky is starting to become a little bit more translucent than it was before. 
less cloud. Um, and these were taken at roughly 4.06 p.m. or 7.06 UTC. Then when you click on the scene, here are a couple of maps uh, predictions from that one. Now they do provide categories in this particular uh, website with respect to the colorations from one to five. Um, and keep in mind that some of the RASC observing programs also as well have a category for both seeing and transparency. Uh, and just a note, at least in the Martha Williams, or sorry, the Isabel Williamson, um, these numbers are reversed in terms of uh, this cat, these categories go from one to five going from bad to good. And the Martha Washington, it's the other one. Five is bad and one is good. So just be aware when you're doing all the uh, categories in your various observing that you make note of which direction those numbers go. But you can see here uh, where Nova Scotia situation um, compared to the snowstorm at uh, T plus six that 42 hours later, we've got a, a lot better seeing than we did at that other previous one. Um, they also go to transparency. And again, when you click on that sky transparency link, it takes you to that chart um, that shows you all the various times that you can uh, see those models. And here are a couple of choices as well, um, where the gray is poor and the white is, um, well, white is cloudy, but the dark blue is, is excellent. And unfortunately, um, we're getting towards excellent, but not quite. But then there's also the thing called local scene. And this describes this, the effect that various um, pieces around you, both your telescope, the walls of your observatory, uh, the floor of the ground, the trees, etc. everything around you also affects your local seeing. Um, and in particular, Ellen points out the uh, telescope uh, where tube currents can dr drastically deteriorate telescopic images. Um, in the mirror type versus the refractors. Uh, also the size of the scope would, would certainly have a bearing in terms of uh, the mirror thickness. Um, solutions for all of this to, to get the most out of your telescope, bring your telescope outside at least two hours before observing, or if you're really lucky, uh, keep your telescope in a permanent observatory. Um, the top of a hill is actually better to observe than at the base or in a valley. And early morning uh, or early evening, 20 to 60 minutes before um, sunrise or sunset is, is better, you might get better seeing um, than during the night. Now as for um, charts, this is the one that most of us are aware of and this is the one that is featured in the chapter that Alan uh, Rahill ha has um, produced. You'll, I'm sure all of us or many of us are familiar with it. There is the typical cloud cover, transparency, seeing in darkness. Uh, I provided some of the color uh, differences there so you can see that, um, uh, for instance, today is not a good day for observing here, obviously, because we've got cloud cover, which means forget about transparency and seeing, and our, um, it's uh, <laughs> uh, not good. But it also provides, oh, also too, on some of the uh, locations, now this is for our observatory, at St. Croix. Um, on some of the forecast sites, there is also uh, under cloud cover, there's something called ECMWF, which is the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasts. And it's, um, it's basically, it's a European forecast model and it's only there for comparing it to the um, Canadian Meteorological Center uh, cloud cover model that we see here. It also provides information on wind, humidity, and temperature. Um, when you look at humidity, uh, red is high, temperature, the red is high, and I don't think we have to worry about high temperatures here, unlike Toronto, which I think is predicted some really good weather. So that's the clear sky chart. There's one more um, site that I'd like to point out to you that is not provided in the handbook. And it too is, is based on the Canadian Meteorological Center uh, model that Alan um, has, developed for forecasting the weather, uh, but it's, it's called, oh yes, before I do that, there are 70 sites in, in Nova Scotia um, that have clear sky charts. Um, 
they're all located there in the, in the uh, map that you're, you're seeing. The two arrows there, the one in the lower, uh, the lower arrow points to St. Croix and the upper one points to Smiley's Provincial Park. You can see their proximity. Um, but the other website, weather forecast website that I want to point or show you is this one, Astrospheric. Um, it's a website, it's also a downloadable app, and it, like I said a moment ago, it, it does include the Canadian Meteorological Center data. Um, but it uses radar, uh, the different, it differs from the clear sky chart, um, only because it uses raw data four times a day versus the sky chart using it only twice. It forecasts for your specific location versus a uh, sky chart predefined. In other words, as soon as you log in, it knows where you are and it can provide the weather that uh, where you at where you're at. Uh, and it upgrades its astronomical variables to better reflect the current conditions. It shows the same, but different variables. So if we look at this, it does show you the map, uh, and this was uh, the chart from this morning. So at 11 o'clock this morning. Uh, you can see the cloud cover over our dear province. Um, compared to the clearest, much clearer skies, or less cloudy skies that, that Toronto has. Um, down below, you can see that it still shows you the cloud cover, the transparency, and the seeing uh, with the colorations that are there. Um, and immediately below that, it, or you see the wavy lines, yellow and uh, gray. The yellow is sunrise, sunset, and the gray is the lunar. Um, so that it shows you the times at which the sun comes up on the, above those wavy lines and it's uh, up and down. And it shows you the lunar rise and set below that. And you can see that the difference is there. You can see below that wavy line is the, um, the wind and it'll show you the direction that is, that it's there. Uh, below that is the um, temperature and dew point, so that if you wanted to know, okay, what, what temperature and what time of the day do I need to be concerned about uh, it doing up and therefore have to either protect the telescope or call it quits. So that's there. Um, it also gives you an extended forecast for the next few days. And below that are the moon details, which uh, CSC doesn't give you. It gives you the current um, moon phase, it's altitude eliminated in age, it's moon phase. It also shows you a map of where you're at. And what's really cool is that in the lower right, it shows you uh, the time of the forecast and when it, you can expect for it to be next updated. So that's just a different site that you can look into it if you're so interested. Um, so, any questions? And I can't, my mouse isn't there. Help. Hold on. I can't. Ah, got it. Thank you. I didn't see any questions in the chat or the questions section, Judy. Oh, there's one that just came up um, from John Smart. For clear dark sky or, or astrospheric, is there, I got it. Is there any way to go back in time to get a record of what the forecast was for documentation? I'm not sure about that. Would uh, people who are more familiar with clear sky chart be able to answer that? I can't say I've ever thought about going back to look. I've never had the concern about what happened. I know you can go into the government, uh, the Canadian government website, the weather website, and ask for previous. Um, but specifically, those two uh, sites, I'm, I'm not sure about. I don't think so. But I don't know for sure. And yes, you did stump me. <laughs> okay. Well, if there are no further questions, um, our next, whoops. Um, our next up is uh, Jerry um, to do with uh, Blair, I guess, mostly Jerry, uh, about the. Part three of anatomy of an imaging system, and I'll let you take over from here, dear. Yes, it's all Jerry tonight. I'm just here to heckle. And you're very good at that. 
I have experience. Can't hear you. This might work better. It might. That it does. I appreciate that, Blair. Of course, everything you said last month was wrong, and, and this is all right. But uh, on the off chance that I may make a mistake here and there, please, please correct me. We'll see how this goes. Uh, as you know, uh, uh, it's been said that I have a uh, face for radio and, and a voice for, for texting. So we'll see how this goes. So I'll uh, attempt to uh, share my screen here. Go to this now. All right, so we have a short PowerPoint that I'll go through fairly quickly and uh, we'll end up with a demo. So this is the third session on uh, anatomy of an imaging system. Um, this is the toys, what you need on a Mac uh, or Linux system. Of course, these aren't toys at all. These are quite uh, important and uh, useful pieces of uh, hardware that everybody has to have. Uh, can you hear, hear me, Judy? I'm not sure. Yeah, uh, otherwise known as toys, right? Yeah, of course. So uh, in the first month, uh, Blair gave a description generally of the hardware and software. Uh, last month, he did the uh, PC software integration and demo. And this month, uh, we're doing uh, the Max Unix uh, uh, side of things. I'm, I'm going to try and do that. I can't actually see myself, so I'm going to... Uh, and modify this so I'm the person. Uh, I keep seeing Blair. Anyway, anyway, there we go. So uh, this is a. Uh, I don't know if you can see me or not, but uh, I I will uh, keep the uh, these PowerPoint up, and I'll try and show you something uh, on my my own screen, my video feed, and uh, this is the Raspberry Pi. So this is important to me because I remember typing cards for computer programming on an IBM uh, card punch. And it's been a long time and things have really changed if uh, you can put a computer like this in your hand. And we'll see uh, how it can be used. We'll see how it can be used, but uh, there we go. So uh, compared to the PC side, there are fewer pieces of software available for uh, OS X on the Macintosh and Linux, but there are a number. Uh, this list uh, uh, is available on the PowerPoint on our website if you uh, want to look at this in detail subsequently. Uh, I keep losing control here. All right. So, we're going to focus on uh, open source uh, software called KSTARS ECOS. Uh, it runs on Windows OS 10, Linux, and incorporates uh, all of these features in one package, uh, the planetarium software, uh, telescope, uh, camera control, support for electronic focusers, guiding, including PhD2. Can you see my mouse? Do you think, yeah, okay, all right, good. So internal plate solving uh, to uh, solve an image and flew to that point in the sky uh, I, and uh, to load uh, a previously existing image and flew there as well. Polar alignment fits images, uh, network access, and an observation planner to identify viewable objects to, uh, for a unite session. There's an automatic scheduler for uh, asking it to decide what should be imaged first and let it decide the, the sequence of things, a mosaic imager, weather alerts, dome control, and uh, typically all the device drivers are installed for you to begin with. There is a developmental Indie Hub agent for sharing your uh, results automatically over the internet through uh, IndieHub.space. There's uh, no social media integration yet. So how does it all work? Well, Indy architecture is very similar to the ASCOM architecture that uh, Blair was uh, referring to last month. Uh, the major difference is that uh, rather than being directly on, on uh, within a computer by default, 
this uses internet sockets and the uh, it inherently over the uh, over the network. So uh, that can happen between uh, uh, different computers uh, separated by any distance or it can end up being within the same computer. So this Indy or Indy uh, instrumental neutral distributed interface uh, is open source. It is cross-platform. It's client agnostic. Clients are those uh, software packages that are, are running to actually capture and do what you'd like to do. And it's distributed, uh, we just said. It can communicate remotely or locally, uh, transparently without any, uh, any differentiation. There's also any server for Windows. Uh, that's a wrapper in this case for uh, the ASCOM drivers. It's available, there's a link for it. And uh, it's a separate installer from the normal uh, K, uh, ECOS uh, KSTARS uh, download. I have run it, uh, this is, these are some screen captures from my computer, but it was running on my uh, Macintosh and emulating Windows. So it wasn't a great experience for me. I presume it works better on a real PC. So Indy supports many devices, uh, a number of telescopes, cameras, focusers, filter wheels, uh, auxiliary devices, domes, and weather stations. And you can write your own if you're uh, so inclined. In terms of clients, uh, who, who, who can call it? Uh, K-Stars and ECOS are uh, the two that I'm most interested in. Uh, there are a number of others. We're going to talk about KSTARS and ECOS in this uh, demo. So KSTARS is, is the free open source uh, cross-platform astronomy software. It provides the planetarium style view of the sky and, and uh, includes there, as it says, uh, 100 million stars and 13,000 deep sky objects. So by my calculations, 13,000 deep sky objects, if, uh, if we can see a maybe half of those and then from where we are here in the Northern Hemisphere. And uh, if one in every four days is a clear night, uh, that's sufficient to uh, uh, cover 25 years worth of observations if you look at three of them per night. So uh, probably a reasonable starting point. ECOS is the uh, companion to K-STARS and it is the actual device controller that talks to the physical cameras and telescopes, et cetera. We're, we're going to show you that. Cost includes uh, internal guiding software. Uh, Blair mentioned uh, in the first talk that uh, guiding is used uh, to uh, correct the, the tracking of the uh, telescope. Here in this image, there is a small guide scope a uh, telescope on top of the uh, main telescope and a guide camera stuck in the back of it. So uh, with that running, you can either use its internal guiding software or the uh, PhD2 to uh, improve your tracking. PhD2 is actually a, a better product. ECOS has three plate solving approaches. Plate solving is used to figure out where exactly you're looking, irrespective of what the telescope thought you were looking at to begin with, if you didn't get your alignment quite right. Uh, Ask that, uh, which is a, uh, another open source uh, or free, at least, uh, package. Uh, astrometry.net, which can be run locally on, on your computer or on the Raspberry Pi in this case, or uh, it can go in online and get and ask the online version, the Nova Astrometry.net, to uh, solve your image for you. KSTARS again runs on many small little platforms, uh, and uh, we've got a couple of them here. So, how does it really work? Well, we'll just, uh, it doesn't always work as you might hope. If you look at this list, you uh, check to make sure things are good. You uh, set up the camera and the tripod, attaching everything together, uh, including the batteries and GPS, and then you drive back to Halifax for the counterweights you've forgotten. Uh, that may have happened to me yeah, only once so far. 
the initial polar rough, uh, rough polar alignment, uh, I, we have a polar scope here on our, our telescope to uh, make that work. Uh, get close to uh, Polaris. We start the mount, fitting the time and date position. Uh, I've found that minus four for us here works much better than four. Uh, for some time, I was wondering why it kept saying, no, you can't slew there because that's below the, the horizon. And no, 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 it isn't. I can see that. Why do you think it's below the horizon? So uh, getting the right time zone makes a bit of a difference. Connect to your hotspot on the computer or drive back to Halifax for the password you've forgotten. Adjust the focus using a Batnock mask. Align the mount using reference stars and calibration stars. Refine that polar alignment using a southern star near the meridian. And having done that, you're ready to uh, start imaging, unless of course you accidentally kick the tripod or, or pull out the power cord. Slew to the target and plate or plate solve to an existing image to slew to a previous target that you want to continue imaging. Plate solve to uh, provide the uh, WCS uh, information. Set up your guiding to run. Configure the capture software or use a session plan where it will figure out what's the best object to, uh, to, to shoot in, in whatever sequence it wants to do it. And remember to take dark frames at the end of the session. And uh, in the end, uh, astrospheric may have been wrong and you watch the cloud roll in, roll in. Sometimes the results can be promising. So we're going to try and attempt uh, a live demo here of uh, K-STARS. So K-STARS has two versions, the stable version, updated, uh, updated less frequently, and the nightly build, commonly called the bleeding edge version, for good reason. We'll be Jerry? showing the bleeding edge version. Jerry, there was a question. Does your reference to OS 10 also include Mac OS Catalina? Yes, yes, I'm running on the uh, most up-to-date version of software. Okay, we're gonna try a demo of K-STARS and see how far we go. So if I can get out of that. We will jump into, this is a, uh, hide that here. This is a no machine, which is like a, uh, a remote desktop connection into a computer. Uh, if you can see me, uh, I'm pointing up at the uh, Raspberry Pi on top of the telescope. Uh, that's the computer that we're talking to, not too far away at the moment. Um, and we have K-STARS running here, there's the icon up here. So it is launched uh, down here. Uh, I'll, I'll just hide this for now. This is the uh, ECOS interface. So we will try and close that button. So Jerry, all we see you is your shared screen. We don't see you. Oh, at least the, the members won't see you, I don't think. Well, but if, if they uh, have the list of uh, presenters yeah. off on the side, okay. hopefully I'm there. Uh, anyway, this, this uh, I can, I'll switch back out to, to show that in the next part. So this is the uh, observatory portion of it. Um, we can see that uh, uh, there's a night sky here, uh, and there's a telescope. I'll try and get back in here to see it. So here we are uh, visually looking at the North American Nebula. We right click, I am going to ask the telescope to go there. And if you can see me, uh, <laughs> You can see the telescope is moving. I'm going to cancel that FaceTime. And uh, uh, we have uh, moved the telescope to point to there. Hi. Oh. <laughs> Excuse me. Excuse me. 
um, my grandson. So, uh, uh, all right, we are going to uh, uh, bring up the K-STARS environment. And uh, yes, I am. Um, we're going to bring up case there. I've sort of lost where I am. There we go. We'll come back. The main window here lets us see that uh, uh, what we're going to image. We have some other icons here which represent the other portions of the interface. The uh, primary one here is the camera interface. In this case, we are connected to an icon uh, camera. Uh, we can set the exposure, the ISO. Uh, it has automatically filled in the uh, object that we're going to uh, target because it, it knows where we're pointing uh, and it will include the duration and uh, uh, timestamp in the image, in the file name. So we can ask it to uh, take a picture. It won't be a particularly good picture because we're looking at the wall. And uh, it then has to download this. This is a 90 megabyte file. So it takes a little bit to uh, finish. Uh, all right. And uh, We'll try and be patient here. All right, so a fits viewer has come up on the left. It hasn't quite finished rendering. There it is. So this shows us uh, and will show us uh, subsequent images as they become available. Typically, we would uh, have set, let's do 100 images or something and just uh, add it, added it to this list of things to, to execute and it would do that. So in this way, you could, if you had uh, a camera that had filters, you could add multiple uh, requests here, one for each filter, and uh, have them execute all at once. There is a focus module. If you have an uh, electronic focuser, you can choose to have it focus. There is a an alignment uh, tab to capture and solve where you're looking. I'm, I want to show a bit of this on the uh, the uh, simulator on the other computer shortly. And uh, there is a mount control, so you can actually uh, control the mount physically if you want. So that works. Uh, this is through the computer that's attached to the telescope. I'd like to just flip now to another computer here. I don't know if you can see me in the, uh, I'm sharing my screen for a second. So uh, this is the uh, Raspberry Pi we're about to uh, connect to, uh, very small, uh, they're less than hundred dollars, and uh, not too much of a security risk if it's on the on the uh, telescope. Okay, we'll go back to my desktop here. So now we are on that small Raspberry Pi. Same sort of interface. This this interface here is. Uh, the night sky, uh, the, the telescope is hiding somewhere. If we zoom out, uh, we don't have a telescope connected yet. Let's uh, go to ECOS. And here we have a choice of uh, profiles. Uh, simulators is one of the ones built in, or you can choose your own gear. Here you can add a uh, 
your own profile to make whatever you'd like. So you just give it a name and then you choose amongst these list of drivers what you would like to add. So here in the Celestron, we could choose, for instance, the CGM level of driver. There are a rather large list of, of uh, cameras you can choose. These are actual libraries. So essentially all of the ZWO ASI cameras would be available through that driver. Uh, you can choose that driver as an example. If you have a guider, you can choose the appropriate camera for that. If you have a focuser, you can choose the focuser you have. Uh, I have a uh, Pegasus focuser. Essentially, that's all you have to do. I, on this particular telescope, I have a GPS uh, uh, USB interface added, so it will pick up and provide me with the uh, proper time and place. Uh, and you can save that. And then now that's an, an available profile to run. But we're going to go back to the simulators here. And we won't edit that. Uh, well, we'll see if we can. It, sometimes it's resilient to being edited because it doesn't want you to change them. We'll start that up. So this is the Indie control panel that's come up to show you the devices that you have requested. The telescope simulator, the focus simulator is running, the guide simulator, and finally the camera, the CCD. So they're all running. Uh, we don't need to keep this uh, window open. Uh, some of the debugging information is, is available in that window if you want. So similarly as before, there is this main control panel. There is a sequence uh, controller where you can uh, control uh, multiple sessions running. And, and in, well, I'll come back to that. Primarily, uh, the first steps might be to solve, capture and solve where you are. So uh, I presume we're, uh, we are uh, probably pointing at Polaris. Let's see if it can figure out where we are. So it's capturing a five second image. It downloaded it, it's starting the solver. And uh, I'm not sure where we're looking. Did anybody recognize that? It's synced to that. OK, so it finished the solver. It knows where it's looking. Uh, that would help the uh, uh, subsequent movement of the telescope. While we're sitting there, we can just point to uh, Orion there and say, in this simulator, go there. And Polaris was probably up to the right. It should be finding its way down here. There it comes. So our simulated telescope is centering itself on Orion, Orion Nebula. So now if we uh, Ask for another plate solve. Should only take a few seconds. This is useful for the precise positioning of, uh, of, of the uh, orientation of that image relative to the stars you're looking at. So it has solved that again, and it has actually placed the image, uh, the solved image, on the screen here to say that's exactly where you are. As an alternative, if you had previously imaged this uh, nebula, you could load a previous image and uh, have it slew to that, slew to the coordinates of that image. Uh, I can't see the question and answer uh, uh, field, so. Uh, if there are questions, I, I'm blissfully unaware of them. There are no none. questions or comments so far. Excellent. All right. So uh, this is the focus simulator. Um, you can choose to uh, autofocus, and it would go through the process of uh, 
uh, varying the, the uh, position of the focus module, you know, the focuser, uh, and essentially produce a, a V curve here of uh, relative uh, uh, sharpness of the chosen emit star until it finds the sweet spot. It, it is helpful to actually start with a Batonoff mask uh, focus to begin with, because these, uh, these uh, electronic focusers typically assume that you don't have to go that far to get to the correct focus point. There is a guiding module then. Um, so if PhD, this is set uh, to connect to uh, an external gu guider in this case. So if PhD were running, uh, we can launch it here. It will come up and say, uh, you haven't been run before. So uh, I don't actually want to go through the profile wizard. So we won't do a, we won't turn on guiding, but PhD guiding works as it would on any other platform. Uh, and uh, KSTARS uh, ECOS sort of just snoops on the results from KSTARS and presents them here so you can see it. This also gives you the option here of specifying the amount of dither that you would like uh, to occur between images to reduce some of the noise. Uh, I, Telescope control, as we saw before, you can set and park your mount if you'd like to in the morning. Uh, having set a, a series of uh, images, let's say that we want to take 10 one second exposure images, we would add that to the queue. We could start that sequence and we would get these 10 images. We will just do that for kicks right now. So there's one image um, and it will go through. It's relatively fast when it's uh, a simulator compared to my Nikon. Uh, having done that, we can save that sequence of captures you would like to do out to a file. And we will call this a test. Uh, uh, queue of images we would like to save. And the value of doing that is over here in the scheduler, we can pick up a test sequence and uh, choose that as the type of exposure we would like to use. And then this uh, would let you have more than one job. This is a particular job. So we could schedule multiple jobs to happen with, with different targets and it will more or less uh, figure out what sequence to do that in. So in the, the constraints that make that possible are the altitude uh, that the object has to be a certain altitude to, to begin this job uh, the moon has to be a, a certain uh, distance away from the object. The weather has to be suitable if, if that was checked and we shouldn't be too close to twilight. So, uh, and you can set it to start in the future or as soon as possible. So this, this queuing is sort of interesting. I actually haven't really used it much. But in theory, you could set up multiple things to uh, observe during the night, have it go there, it would plate solve, um, figure out if you're in the right spot, get that correct, and then once one job is satisfied, move on to the next. The, the other value of this is that there is actually a mosaic tool as well. Once you have defined a job in this sequence, you can go in and establish a mosaic to uh, go out and take multiple pictures with a certain amount of overlap and uh, uh, automate, automatically cr create that mosaic as, as, uh, as the night progresses. So uh, I think these are all of the options. These are typically a little, uh, hard to follow to begin with because there's just so many things. Uh, 
up here there are you know, ways to control the uh, the time of when you're looking at at the earth at the sky the, what time of day you are where you are um, there is an observation planner where you can say well what what would I like to do so you can you know what's up tonight we'll let you look at the best nebula let's see what it says for tonight so those are what it thinks are pretty good tonight so from one spot you can sort of plan what you'd like to do if you want to do m43 uh, it will remember this subsequently and and uh, we're already at m43 but that would have centered m43 uh, here in this uh, view of the sky so you can actually go to it. it gives you the details of when it's actually visible not the best object to be uh, imaging uh, this time of year so i think that's uh all i'd like to say uh in the demo uh i i do uh enjoy using uh, k-star's ecos it's a, sometimes a bit of a uh learning curve and not always without problems running on the bleeding edge of software means that uh what one bug fixes maybe it introduces another occasionally so uh, it can be a little frustrating but uh, it's free uh, you can try it out on uh, your your platform of choice and uh, i certainly am, have enjoyed it it uh, it's an interesting alternative. I think that's all I've got to say. Any questions for Jerry? I don't see anything there, Jer. Well, thank you for that. I'm sure it'll, it'll uh, it might inspire some folks who, who have Max to try something different. And hey, thank, <laughs> thank you. Um, and thanks to you and Blair both for uh, presenting the three part series uh, on this. Um, I'm sure it has inspired many people to try some of these programs and, and uh, enhance their observing skills. So thank you for that. Sorry, Judy, we have one question that just showed up. Uh, ah, it did. From Troy. And it says, so it's basically an all-in-one software package for astro imaging? Uh, that's basically it. Uh, it um, can do everything that I need it to do and it runs uh, on uh, a multitude of platforms so it and being free uh, if you want to try it there's not much uh, investment to, to go ahead and try it okay okay well thank you okay last but not least we have a special speaker with us this afternoon and I, i'm really thrilled that you, uh, he could make it um, I'm not going to say a whole lot about his background. I'll let him do that when he does his own introductions. Um, but we're really thrilled today to have Phil Groff, the Executive Director at the National RASC Office. Um, relatively new to the organization, um, but, um, and I'm not going to say any more. I will let you take over, Phil. Thank you, and welcome. Thank you very much, Judy. I really appreciate that. And, uh, and thank you, Jerry, that was great. I really enjoyed that presentation. As a, as a fellow Mac user, uh, it was great to hear, you know, to, to not have to feel PC envy as I often do when I'm talking to astronomers and such. So it was, it was great to learn there are things, tools I'll be able to eventually aspire towards. Um, I am relatively new to the organization, as, as Judy suggested. I, I started uh, my role in October of uh, last year. So it's really been just about six months uh, that I've been here. It's, uh, it's a new area for me. I'm not an astronomer, uh, although I play one on TV. Uh, my PhD is in, uh, is in psychology, actually, although uh, I have worn many other hats over the years, including history of science 
um, science communication and, uh, and also um, basically not-for-profit management, which is what I've done for the past 15 years. And I think that's, uh, that's the skill set that uh, the board was looking for when they uh, hired me to be the executive director here. I do, however, um, although my, my formal training is in astronomy, have a lifelong love of uh, space and of uh, the universe and, and of astronomical and astrophysical sciences. So it's, uh, it's certainly exciting for me to be here and to be um, part of this organization. So uh, thank you for that. I've got some slides to share with you to give you a bit of a, an overview of what's going on at National because I think one of the challenges that's existed over the years, just my reading of the situation from only having recently uh, joined, is that there's often a, a bit of a perceived disconnect between the National Office and the individual centers and the members that are out in those centers. And sometimes I think uh, folks wonder who we are, what the heck we're doing, why you're bothering to pay any fees to us at all, and, uh, and what we're doing with those fees even when you give them to us. So I thought I'd uh, just come on here and do my best as still a relative newcomer to answer those questions for you and take a chance uh, on just opening up some dialogue, answering some questions you might have for me and, and trying to, to build a bit of a bridge back between the national office and the centers. And, and some of you heard that it was my goal to, uh, to visit every center uh, across the, uh, the country in my first year. And I was well on my way to doing that. I, I hit my first three centers and then the world changed radically. <laughs> and uh, so a lot of my uh, flights and, and, and travel plans got uh, suddenly curtailed as I know everybody else's did as well. Uh, so it's great to be able to do some of this virtually and I'm, I'm uh, happy to be doing this. Although I promise you, promise you, the one thing that this doesn't afford is the chance to really have that face-to-face -face interaction and, and really get to know the members of the center. So I will be coming out to Halifax. I do want to actually meet everybody as well. So this doesn't count as your visit, although it will be my chance to do some of these, uh, some of these slides for you. Uh, I think that's about enough about me, so I'll go to the slides. Oh, one other little tidbit that I sometimes like to share with folks is, in addition to being uh, sort of a not-for-profit manager and a psychologist and a historian uh, by training and by avocation, I'm also a professional magician. So when I do come out to see you in Halifax, if you, if you like, you can come up and ask me to, to, to show you something. I'll be happy to, to share a, a magical experience with you. Doesn't work as well on Zoom, so I'm, I'm still trying to figure out what I could do to, to bridge the gap here. but. Uh, when you see me in person, I promise we'll do something. Okay, I'm going to uh, start up my slides and I'm gonna see if I can follow my own advice about how to make sure I've got the uh, sound working correctly. So if you'll just bear with me one moment. All right. Okay, so everyone should be able to see my screen now, should be able to see the, uh, the slides. Um, if you're new to Zoom, there are a couple of tools you can be using right now, by the way, if you still want to see our faces on the panel, um, there's a, uh, you might see, say, my face because I'm speaking right now, highlighted over in one corner of the screen. Uh, if you go over to where that picture of, of me is, you'll find a, a sidebar of the image which allows you to see either the single speaker who's got the focus or the entire panel. Um, in either a grid or a line. And so there, there are a number of tools you can use to kind of adjust what you're seeing at any given time while still seeing uh, my slides on the majority of the screen. So play with it, around, play with it a bit. Um, if I've gotten good at Zoom, it's just by sheer repetition at this point. Uh, I basically live on this program now. Um, this is how most of the work of the society is being conducted. So most of my days are Zoom meetings. And uh, trust me, anything I've learned, it's been by the hard lessons of making countless mistakes. So. Uh, uh, I didn't learn about that sound button until relatively recently, things like that. So, so we'll get there and we'll, and we'll all get there together. So for those of you who may be new to the organization or maybe haven't just thought about RASC as a whole uh, for a while, because you sort of think of it in terms of your local uh, center meetings and the people you see uh, regularly at those sessions, I thought I'd just give a, a couple of quick overview slides here. These were developed by Robin Foray, our uh, first VP, who is uh, likely to be our, our next president as of uh, the AGM that's happening at, uh, at the beginning of next month. So just to, to remind folks of our, our mission and our vision, uh, this, is, this is who RASC is on paper and in, and in our strategic planning and our thinking as a, as a central organization. And really what I wanna call your attention to is not the words of the mission, mission and vision statement, but that central diagram there to show you what we see our job as and what we hold ourselves accountable to. 
we're trying to provide value to individual members. Someone who joins the society should feel they're getting some value for, for, for being part of this society. I think the greatest value is simply that you've joined a 150 year old organization with 5,000 like-minded individuals across the country that you're now part of uh, sort of a, a movement to, to promote astronomical knowledge and, and the love of gazing at the sky to your fellow Canadians. But, but there should be other value as well. And so we try, to, we try to make sure that we're doing that. I know Judy ran down the list of all the, uh, the great benefits you get when you join. One you may not be aware of, Judy, is just recently we have started actually providing a copy of the Explore the Universe guide in its new edition to all new members of the society. So that goes out with your membership kit and your membership card because we recognize when people start, something like the Explorer, the uh, Observer's Handbook can be a little bit intimidating. I mean, obviously we still give that to everyone. It's our flagship product, as you've said, since, since 1907. But if you want a place to start, maybe that's not the best book just to pick up. So we're making sure everyone has a copy of this as well so they can have a, an easier read in their first couple of weeks in the society. In addition to value to individual members, we try to provide value to the centers. These are the 29 soon to hopefully be 30 centers across the country. We have, we have one application that for, for a new center that's come forward. Uh, and it's really at the centers where a lot of the work gets done, where a lot of the socializing takes place, a lot of the outreach and education takes place. So um, we try to provide value to the centers, things like providing uh, the individual centers with the liability insurance that lets you run public sessions and events without having to have the what would be onerous expense for a small uh, center organization to sort of have to buy their own insurance coverage, things like that. Um, and of course, just the educational materials we send to the centers on a, on a regular basis, the, the, the boxes of Sky News we give uh, to you for to have out of outreach events, that sort of thing. Uh, value to the general public. We see ourselves uh, as, in addition to being a membership-based society, we're also a national royal society, and our job is to be kind of the voice, or at least one of the voices of astronomy and space science um, in the Canadian cultural mindset. And, and we're somebody that the press or other people call when they want information, and so we want to provide that value to the public and make sure people are getting the best evidence-based answers to questions that, that folks have. I think the interest, we all agree, in, in astronomy and in space has probably rarely been as high as it is now. It, we're, we're at a, another peak, I think, of public interest in, in space science and in astronomy and astrophysics. And so we like to, to see ourselves as, as one place that people can go to, to to get reliable information. Related to that is our value to the scientific community. I wouldn't say that's probably our, our core business as an organization because of course as, as folks know uh, back in the 70s casca uh, split off with a lot of the professional astronomers who needed their professionals need needs met very specifically uh, by a, a body of their own um, but we are unique amongst astronomy clubs in the world in that while we are an amateur astronomy club we still have a lot of professional members and, uh, and that's a tremendous resource. And we try to, to, to build those connections whenever we can. We, of course, publish the only peer-reviewed um, publication on astronomy in the country, our journal. And so, uh, you know, it may not be the top flight publication destination for, for professional astronomers, but it's a publication destination. And we're proud of that. Again, it's a, it's a longstanding uh, product of ours uh, and, and uh, communications vehicle of ours, just like the uh, Observer's Handbook is. So, those four areas, of course, are all dependent upon the fifth one, namely, we have to remain financially sustainable. And, and so to, to talk about that a little bit further, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna actually open up the books and share some information about our, our money with you in a moment. One last thing here, uh, just a quick overview of how the society's organized, for, because I know sometimes it can be confusing for, for people who, who don't see the, the whole picture like this uh, all the time. There will be a test on this slide, by the way, so you might wanna take some notes because uh, by the end of the session, we'll be, just, just kidding. Okay, uh, if, you, if you note here, what we've got is we've got our 29 centers, our 5,000 members spread across the country. The organ by which those 29, hopefully soon 30 centers communicate uh, nationally is through the National Council, which is kind of the, the committee of centers uh, to, to make sure that we're, we're getting the, the perspective of all the centers reflected. The governance of the organization legally, financially, fiduciarily is, the, is by our board of directors. Um, they take on various executive roules, including being a liaison to some important standing committees. So various 
uh, officers on the board serve on various core committees of the organization. As you can imagine, a 150-year-old society of 5,000 members, the work can't all get done by the staff. Uh, a lot of the work historically has been done by volunteers working on committees. And so the board serves as a, as a, a way of centralizing some of the output from those committees and making sure that, that the committees are talking to one another and that, uh, and that the whole organization is functioning as a single organization. And sometimes that works better than other times, but we try. Um, what's increasingly been happening, of course, is the society's been professionalizing in the sense that our staff has been growing uh, over the last couple of years. It's not that long ago, just a little over 10 years, when there was literally one staff person in this organization. Um, hard as it is to believe a society of this size running with just one staff person. But now we have um, five people uh, in the office every day, as well as a couple of core contractors that work with us very regularly. Um, I've already introduced myself, but you, you should also know Renata, who's been with us for the longest of, of any of the staff people. She's, she's kind of the, the organizational memory uh, that we depend on in the office. Uh, and the glue that really keeps it all together. Renata runs the accounting uh, and and the, the finance system within the uh, within the organization. Some of you probably had to deal with her when there have been problems with credit cards or with invoices or other issues. So if you haven't talked to Renata, I'm sure you will at some point. She has helped out quite ably now with our, our relatively new membership uh, coordinator, Adela, um, who is the, probably the frontline person that many of you to speak to when our aging, creaky uh, IT infrastructure uh, is pre preventing you from doing something as obvious or simple as like changing your address or renewing your membership. Uh, so Adele is probably the person you've had to, had to complain to about that. Um, so hopefully she's helped you out and, and done so with a smile as she tends to. Uh, two other uh, very talented people in the organization, Eric, our marketing and communications coordinator, is responsible for the increasing quality of the look and feel of all of our branded and, and professionally produced materials. Um, he has a committee himself that, that, he, that he works with on marketing and communication that's trying to, to make sure all of the publications that we have are, are uh, sort of working together to provide kind of sort of common messaging and, and supporting each other. And also to make sure that all of our social media channels are up to date and, and working well to, to, to spread the, the core messaging that we want to as an organization. Uh, finally, many of you have probably been aware of Jenna's work as our outreach coordinator. Uh, she has, in the last uh, month and a half, really stepped up to try and, and provide a huge amount of additional programming and, and material during the COVID crisis so that folks don't feel quite as isolated or, or cut off from society events as they might be when face-to-face -face events aren't as possible. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about some of the work that Jenna's been doing in a few moments. So I am moving forward. I, I see we've got a question here. Can we get a break on our CGL insurance because of COVID and our lack of ability to hold public events? Unfortunately, insurance works year to year. And we actually have a pretty good insurance broker um, who works with us very closely on, on making sure we get the best deal that we can. And uh, we're right in the process of uh, renegotiating that right now. So. Uh, we don't get any particular break right now. We'll see how long the, the, the restrictions on events hold. There may be down the road some conversation we can have about that. But by and large, unfortunately, as I say, insurance is an annual thing, not a month by month thing. So let's talk about money. Um, and let's talk about uh, where our finances come from and where they go to, because I know that's something that people are curious about. We have really three major sources of income in the society. And I'm showing you uh, what our, what our year-end was last year, what our budget was last year, what our budget for this year is. And we'll talk a little bit about what's happened to our budget in the last six weeks in a moment. But uh, basically, you can see that the, the three big pots of money in, in our organization are membership fees, publications, and then grants and donations. And what you can see is over the years, grants and donations has been becoming an increasingly larger share of what we've been, uh, what we've been doing over the years. Last year, we had a phenomenal uh, windfall, if you look down here near the bottom, in terms of investment income. It was a, it was a bull year for the markets, and the, the money that we have invested in the bank that came from the, the sale of our property back when we moved out of the building on, on, in the annex a couple of years ago, um, did a really good job of, of a return on investment for us last year. Slightly less good, you'll see, was the line above it, namely our investment in Sky News magazine. Uh, we took a real hit on Sky News last year for a number of reasons. 
uh, jumps of some costs in the publishing industry across the board that nearly wrecked a number of major Canadian magazines. Um, and then some, some individual issues with the management and, and the organization of the, of the publication itself. Now, I want to reassure folks when they see that number, and they see even how much worse it is than what we budgeted for last year, Sky News runs on a different fiscal year than the organization. It's a, it's a separate, standalone, for-profit company. And like a lot of for-profit companies, it runs on the April to March fiscal year, whereas the RASP runs on a January to, to December fiscal year. So what you see for 2019, the impact of Sky News on us for last year, that's really reflecting where Sky News was last March. Since last March, we went through a huge reorganization process with the magazine. Um, we hired a, a, a great publishing consultant to, to take us through some, some, some tough love and help us restructure things the way we needed to. And uh, over the course of the last um, sort of March to this March, we turned around the operation of the magazine completely. Uh, brand new, fresh, young editorial staff, uh, some of you notice a new look and feel for the magazine as we've rebranded and re, uh, redesigned it, a new website to try and draw more attention to the magazine and to sort of modernize um, the brand beyond simply what appears on the magazine pages, but, but, but now becomes the, the online presence of the, the magazine as well. And as a result, at the start of this year, I was very conservatively budgeting a break-even year for Sky News, which would have been happy news uh, over the last two years that we'd had the, the, uh, the magazine in, uh, as, a, as an investment. In reality, at the end of March, and now this is not official because, of course, the Sky News finances haven't been audited yet from the end of March, but uh, it looks like we have almost a $40,000 profit on the year for Sky News uh, for 2020. So, you know, that's, that's a, that's a $100,000 about face, which, uh, which we're pretty pleased with. So, the magazine is now starting to not only serve as a great communications vehicle for us as a society, but it's actually, for, for once, now starting to make money for us again as well. So we're hoping to be able to, to keep it profitable and also with the, the work of our amazing new managing editor and, and the new staff and, and such we've got involved with it to, to really um, to keep, keep it going, keep the lights on and, uh, and get, have, make sure that the next 25 years of the magazine are even more successful. So that's the, the good news side of the story uh, in terms of where the money comes from. Let's talk about where the money goes to. And it really goes out in four major streams in the organization. So I'm going to just in, in order that I'm going to talk about member services, which these are the direct benefits that we provide to individual members. So things like you getting your copy of the Observer's Handbook and your Sky News subscription and all the other things that we do running running Adela's work in the office that she does for the individual members. Um, that, that's all covered off here under member services. Second major cost area is publications. Uh, obviously, publications make money for us, and, and it's, it's very much in, in the black, uh, the, the publication side of the organization. You know, we're a quarter of a million dollar publishing house each year, but it does cost money to produce things as well. And so that's, that's another major cost center for the organization. Third, you see under programming, most programming in the organization is relatively inexpensive, and a lot of it is lined up pretty closely with, uh, with some income lines, um, and some grants and whatnot that specifically cover off particular programs. But the big one there, that public center outreach, that's our supportive centers. So that's all the stuff we do for the centers, including, for example, your insurance, including you know, sending you the boxes of Sky News for your outreach events, other, other materials we provide over the years, the, the coordination and, and such that we help provide for, for center events and, and uh, tracking the volunteer hours and such over the, over the course of the year. So that's, that's our third major chunk of, of uh, change going out. And last but not least, there's the national operations. There's simply the, the, you know, the rent on our office space and, you know, my salary and and things like that 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 come out of um, the national operations line. So four major areas that the money goes out into. I will say if you compare the 2020 budget ex total expense line to total income line, you can see that for 2020 we had forecast about an eighteen thousand um, uh, dollar surplus for this year. So well above a break even budget. We were hoping to make a little bit of money this year. Things were looking good. And then about six weeks ago, the world changed. And so we're uh, working very hard to shore up our finances and to make sure that we're not taking as horrible a financial hit as we could as an organization. But of course, we are going to take a bit of a hit. There are, there are unfortunately, 
people who are going to be unable to, to renew their membership because they're, they're out of work now or other things have happened in their lives as a result of COVID. And, and so we're going to lose some membership that way. Perhaps even worse, we're not going to gain some of the new members we, we gain every year because a lot of our recruiting happens at star parties, at live events. And while those events aren't happening, there's less opportunity to reach out to new members of the public. And so we'll probably get a few fewer new members signing up this year. Another, of course, major hit uh, that we're going to be taking this year is in the investment income line. You'll notice uh, we had a great year last year. I was very conservative in my estimates for this year, dialed us way back, much closer to what we budgeted in 2019. Uh, but of course, that was before the stock markets um, did what they've done for everybody. And you've probably all noticed your personal investments, your RSPs and such have taken a huge hit since COVID. Well, so have our investments. And we'll see what we have to do to try and, and recover a bit from that. To make a long story short, the staff, the management, the board, we're working very hard to control our costs and to keep our expenses down. And, and we're well under our budgeted expenses right now, but we're, we're under our budgeted uh, revenues right now as well. So we're doing what we can to find alternative sources of revenue and to, to shore up what revenue we have. So that's the, the money side of things. And I'll answer some more questions on that, I'm sure, but towards the end of the talk when, when, when folks want to want to ask ask more about the nitty gritty of, of things. I thought I'd just talk for a few minutes at kind of the more strategic uh, side of things. When I joined the organization back in, in uh, October, folks asked me what I thought about the RASP and what I thought about uh, where we were at and where we could be and what was going on. And so based on my, my you know, almost two decades now experience in, in heading up charities and not-for-profits, I talked to a lot of people, reviewed a lot of documents, and, and the picture of the RASC is, guess what? Um, a good and bad news. We have exactly the same challenges as every other membership-based association on the planet. Uh, competing time pressures. Our volunteers are feeling burned out. Our, our membership is aging as a demographic uh, cohort. Uh, value expectations are changing. N uh, uh, younger demographics uh, have different views of what it means to be a member of a society or what it means to join anything. And so um, all of those challenges are being faced by every membership-based organization across the planet. Guess what? Some of them are not doing well. A lot of membership-based organizations are failing. And some of the ones you would not expect, um, the American Bar Association is hemorrhaging members right now. There are more lawyers than ever in North America, but the Bar Association is losing members. So that's, a, that's kind of shocking. That's, that's the world we live in. That's the, that's the environment we have to survive in. The, the good news is there are answers to all of these challenges, and there are organizations that have succeeded and have been succeeding at, at navigating the new normal for membership organizations. And, uh, and we've already made headway even before I started on a lot of the ways that people are doing that. There are kind of five strategies that by and large people have been using to, to be successful in the changing face of what it means to be a membership organization. First of all, the first two bullets here are really about the same thing. Every organization that has survived has done so by professionalizing a bit. So you can't, you can't run a huge multi-million dollar, multi-thousand member organization by committee. In the end, you know, you do need a strong central board to, to sort of serve as the, as the one point of governance. You still need the volunteer voice, you still need the members involved, but you need a strong board and you need a strong professionalized staff uh, to sort of be, be responsible um, and, and, you know, a staff you can hold accountable for, for, for outcomes and such in a way that you can't really with a volunteer uh, uh, base. You know, if I'm, if I'm not doing my job, if, if the, the budget is too far out of whack, I want to, you can fire me. <laughs> it's hard to fire a well-meaning volunteer, you know, who's, who's been devoting, you know, 20 years of their life to a particular role. Um, so empowering the staff and, and really building up staff expertise, overhauling the governance structure to just tighten things up and professionalize things a little bit, those are two really important things. And they were well underway by the time I was even hired. Um, third, recognizing that membership is changing, what people expect out of a membership is changing, who our prospective members are is changing. Um, our demographic, as I said, is aging. Um, but we have the opportunity now with all of the emphasis on STEM education and expanding interest in the sciences, especially for young women, for marginalized communities, for people of, of different ethnic backgrounds, 
there's a great opportunity for the society to, to partially reinvent itself and make itself more open and accessible and, and enticing to, to a broader demographic than ever before. That means also taking a good look at why people would want to join, what they value out of being a member, and, and what they don't value, and why people choose not to stay as part of the, the organization. We're, we're about to launch two major surveys, one of our current members and one of people who've recently left us, um, to, to better fine tune what it is we could be doing better going forward. Um, and then rationalizing programs and services, and that, need, that has to happen regularly. Um, you may notice that we're doing a lot of new programming right now, and that's because the environment changed. COVID-19 changed the way the RASC can do business as an organization for the short to medium term. And so we had to adapt by changing the kind of programming we offer for the short to medium term. All of this is dependent upon us having the right technology in place to, to, support, to support things. And as I mentioned, our current membership database is creaky and old and falling apart uh, and fails as often as it succeeds. Our list serve technology is on it. Our listservs are on their last legs, as people know, um, but that's okay. The IT committee, the board, the staff have, have done the due diligence. We have found solutions and we are in the process of installing new software that is going to take the society forward, hopefully for the next 10 plus years uh, with, with much better infrastructure. It's going to take a couple of months to get everything up and running, but in a couple of months from now, it'll be a completely different organization. You won't even recognize it, how effortless it will be for you to modify your membership details uh, on the website, how easy it will be for, for you to renew your membership. In fact, for the first time ever, we'll be able to have automatic renewal for people <laughs> so they don't even have to worry about it year after year if you don't want to. Um, and a lot of other options are going to be available for the centers. It's going to, never going to, it, it will be so much easier for you to get center level reports. And, and data out of the, out of the, the system. Uh, so much easier for uh, committees to get up-to-date information about committees. The website will be regularly updated with proper information about who's in what committee, who's in the executive or which center. Um, and all of that will also be integrated throughout the whole website, making sure that the right permissions for what documents people can access and what sites you know, are available to whom all functions seamlessly. And yes, we're replacing the listserv system as well with a, with a new hybrid system that people can have either as a listserv or as a discussion forum, whatever you're more comfortable with. It doesn't matter, it's the end user's choice because the same information will be available to the, to the membership whichever way they choose to interact with it. So <laughs> I, got, I got a yay, yay from uh, David Lane on that. Yes, <laughs> Dave has been a hero. <laughs> Dave, Dave is my hero <laughs> in, in terms of how hard he's been working to try and keep things together. Uh, so, so, uh, and, and one of many uh, heroes who've been trying to keep the, keep the IT and the organization functioning. So uh, this will all be up and running soon. And yes, we'll be working with the members and with the, uh, the centers to make sure that we're not just surprising you with new features or, or things. There will be instructional videos, there will be webinars, there will be all kinds of hands-on, well, maybe not hands-on, but maybe zoom on <laughs> tutorials and other help available. So. At the start of March, we had uh, a meeting of the board of directors in our office. Twice a year, we try to get the board together face to face because as those of us who are living through these COVID times know, there really is no real replacement for face to face contact and actually being in a room together sometimes. Sometimes you just need to be able to see each other across the table, be able to look each other in the eye and really build trust that way. Um, so it was great to have this meeting. This, is, this was my second in-person meeting that we had the last one we held was in October of last year, right after I joined. So I've, I've had the, the, the fabulous privilege of being able to spend two two day um, uh, meetings with the board of directors since I've been in the organization. I don't know when the next one we're gonna be able to hold will take place, possibly this coming October, maybe not in 2020, we'll see. Um, but I just wanted to, to bring up some faces here because some of you may never get to see the board and, uh, and, and not be able to put faces with names. Now, some of you old hats have been around for a while and know lots of people, but, but many people out there in the membership don't. So here's Mike Watson on the end here. He's our, our in-house counsel and, uh, and a member at large on our, our board. This is our, out, our, our former president, Colin Hay. Uh, this is Charles Ennis, who's our second VP right now. The guy in the middle there hopefully needs no introduction. Um, this is our treasurer, Catherine Carr, our current president, uh, Chris Gaynor, 
our current VP number one, uh, Robin Foray, who is likely to inherit the presidency in, in lucky him in, <laughs> in a month's time or so. And, uh, and this is our, our current secretary, uh, Eric Briggs uh, from the Toronto Center. So uh, I just wanted to put some, some friendly faces out there with names. And, uh, and also show you a couple of scenes from the, that two-day meeting. This is in the, the boardroom at the office, place I haven't seen in a little while. Uh, but it's, uh, it's also, as you can see in the backdrop, currently housing the, the collection for our telescope museum and the archives of the organization. Uh, you see Colin over there is standing in front of the hundred uh, plus years of, uh, of back issues of the Explorer's Handbook and of the journal. Um, but you can see a couple of other faces here I just wanted to introduce to you. Um, th uh, this, this woman here is Lisa. Uh, Lisa DeVito is our fundraising coordinator. Uh, she is an amazing individual. She took us uh, over the last two years from an organization that had made about $20,000 a year in donations to one that's making close to $300,000 a year in donations. Um, she did this by doing such shocking things as asking people if they'd donate. I know, it's an astonishing idea, but you know what, if you do it, sometimes it works. <laughs> She's also found a lot of great grants and, and, and public funding, uh, publicly available funding out there for us. Uh, we found some great sources of additional funding to help bolster the magazine uh, that's available to publishers and such. So Lisa's been doing a great job. Um, in the background there, there's Renata. I, t I told you about uh, Renata earlier, and, and many of you know her. That's uh, Jenna Hines, smiling at the camera here. Jenna is, of course, the phenomenal powerhouse that's driving all of our new outreach efforts right now, and, and of course, has a long history of working on our older outreach efforts, such as the Robotic Telescope. Uh, just barely visible in profile here, that's Alendria Brunes, our new um, managing editor for Sky News. Uh, flipping around to the other side here, uh, you can see some board members working at the table again. Uh, standing up in front of the table there, you see uh, this is Adela. So you put her face uh, with a name. You see Eric uh, here uh, wearing his jaunty eye patch. For, for those of you who don't know, Eric was in a very serious car crash just before Christmas. Uh, we nearly lost him. Um, and at the time of this meeting, he was still having to wear an eye patch on alternate eyes because he was still having a little bit of double, double vision. He's, he's doing much better now. He's doing great and he's working hard for the organization. We're, we're thrilled about that. But you can see his spirits were not down even, even back when he was uh, not feeling as well. Um, sitting next to Eric, I've got Jenna in both, both uh, sides of the picture here. I'm not sure how she managed to be on both sides of the boardroom simultaneously, but that just gives you an idea of her energy and, 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 uh, and dedication. Um, you do see uh, very briefly in the corner here, you can see Randall Rosenfeld. He's our society archivist and, and the head of our history committee. And, and Randall is the one um, who is curating the telescope museum for us. Turning to some of that work that Jenna's doing right now, I'd, I'd just like to highlight for folks um, some of the many different current offerings. Uh, it's great the Halifax Center is holding monthly meetings, both for their executive and for their members like this but not every, every center has been able to do so. And so, um, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're thrilled to be able to offer some programming for, for the members out there um, who, uh, who need, you know, to get a little bit of their astronomy fix in uh, and don't feel that they can do so just on their own. So we've got the Insider's Guide to the Galaxy happening now every Tuesdays at 3.30. Uh, Jenna works with a variety of different guests, most frequently Chris Vaughn from the Toronto Center looking at Stellarium and looking at other tools and, and tips and tricks, especially for people who are relatively new to astronomy, but even for old hat, hats, there's lots to, to learn. Just last week, they did a whole session on the different electronic tools and websites and such that are out there that Chris uses to, to find everything from where the ISS is to, to um, you know, the best uh, website for tracking uh, different asteroids and, and, uh, and comets in the solar system learned lots of fabulous stuff. It's where I first learned about the, the weather uh, 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 astrosphere that, uh, that we looked at before, astrospheric. Anyway, uh, happening every Tuesdays, check it out. Uh, every Monday, we have a, a members only session called How to Use the Observer's Handbook. Again, I was saying a lot of uh, members find the, that big tome as, as wonderfully informative as it is, a little intimidating. It's a big brick, right? And there's, you open it up and you see numbers and lots of numbers and <laughs> complicated charts and such. So um, this is a way to have the different contributors of the different sections of the handbook take the new reader through and kind of explain what their section's about and how to get the best use out of it. 
Um, I think it's fabulous. I'm certainly learning lots by, by attending those sessions. Every other Wednesday, uh, Jenna hosts a, a, a self-isolation star party. Up until now, they've been relatively theoretical with, a, again, a lot of Stellarium views and such. We're hoping now as the weather gets better and, and such that we'll be able to use the robotic telescope in California to do some live imaging uh, of things. And uh, so that's the plan going forward. And it's why we start the, the star party so late because uh, you know 1030 uh, Eastern gives us a chance to let the sun start to set on the Pacific coast and eventually we'll then be able to bust out the telescope and use it. And, uh, and then once or twice a, a month, we've got a special speaker series. Uh, I know last month you, you may have tuned in to hear uh, Randy talking about the, the Apollo 13 uh, 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 disaster and recovery um, and talking uh, with guest astronaut Fred Hayes, the pilot of the lunar module on Apollo 13. So that was, uh, that was pretty cool. And then uh, more recently, we had our, our president, Chris Gaynor, talking about his book on the 30-year history of the Hubble Space Telescope with the guy who's been the news director for the Hubble Space Science Institute since before the telescope was launched, the fellow who actually coined the phrase pillars of creation for that picture we all know and love. Um, so that was kind of exciting. We've got two what planned already for this month as well. This next coming Friday, uh, you can attend a session that Heather Laird, a longtime member and former board member of the Society, is, is running on um, the history of women in astronomy in Canada. And then um, uh, two weeks after that, on the Thursday evening, rather than the Friday, two weeks after that, on the Thursday, the 21st, uh, Randall Rosenfeld um, is going to be doing a talk that's part history, part philosophy, about changing views of what it means to observe through the eyepiece over the last couple of hundred years of observational astronomy and why it is sometimes when we look at the descriptions or the images in old, old books of astronomy, the pictures look bizarre or weird to us and not at all like what we see when we look through our eyepiece at the same objects now. So he's gonna be talking a little bit about what's changed about the way we view the universe and what's changed about the way we view ourselves and how, uh, and how that's influenced the way we describe what we're seeing. And, uh, and what does it mean to really see something through the telescope? So those are what are coming up in the future. Phil, yes. Um, on your webs on the RASC national website uh, in the masthead where it says COVID nineteen, uh, you're able to um, when you click on that and you're able to get the, these lists. It comes up with a calendar, and I've noticed that the Insider's Guide is no longer on the calendar. Is there a reason for that? I think what's happened is it 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 uh, the old version of it got taken off. It used to be twice a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, but it was too much because, for one thing, the, the question and answer period always went long, and, and so the one-hour session was always going to an hour and a half and even longer. And, and frankly, I was just getting a little concerned about Jenna burning herself out. <laughs> so yeah. we've done it back to once a week. It may not have made it back into the calendar, but it is on. It is on Tuesdays, uh, 3.30 Eastern time. Now, I know those times, we set the, uh, the times for a lot of the sessions during the day because we knew some people were at home self-isolating, and we knew that there were a lot of kids at home who needed a little bit of stimulation and, and, and science uh, uh, information to help you know, augment their curriculum work. Um, we know that, that that doesn't work for everybody who's working during the day. But every one of these sessions is being taped. Every one of these sessions is available on our YouTube channel. So if you've missed something, you can go back and hear it. Okay. How, uh, I've got a question here. How would I receive the announcements? I haven't actually become a member yet, though I plan to. Do I have to do that first? Um, when, you when you become a member, you will automatically get certain kinds of email blasts from us, and you will have the option of joining the, um, the RASC bulletin list, which, which you should join, because that's the, the primary organ we use to send out information on a sort of semi-monthly basis. Um, other than that, if you just check the relevant sections of the website regularly, that's where you can get some updates from. Okay, so that's answering that, I hope. So I just wanted to do a, an, another quick uh, overview of some of the other programming we've got up that, uh, that people might be interested in. I talked about the Dorner Telescope Museum briefly, and, and we hope to eventually have a new home for the society where we'll be able to display these scopes properly. Um, that's, that's the end goal. You can see just some of the amazing pieces we've got here, including this monstrous F8 uh, 10 inch, actually it's an F10, I think, uh, 10 inch reflector from the 1920s we've got. Um, but it's a huge beast. We have to have a place that can actually house it um, to, to, to do it justice. 
uh, to say nothing of some of the other beautiful replicas that we've got. Uh, I was going to just show you um, a brief video. Um, I was very privileged just before Christmas to go on a, a collecting trip with Randall and Jenna to pick up a couple of pieces for the museum in Montreal. And while there, met, of course, the very talented, famous to many members of our society, uh, telescope manufacturer, Norman Fulham. Um, and we just did, made a, a brief video of that visit with him. So here you go. Just a matter of uh, wanting to do something. It's not. Nobody forced it on me. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, yeah it, it was my trademark. Perfect. At one point, my car and business card was oh. the man in the moon. And I said, let's do a, a solar yeah. eclipse or a moon eclipse. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm Norman Follum. I'm from pointe aux Trembles, uh, east side of Montreal, east end of Montreal. People starting to, to ask me to make the mirror, small, eight, six, 10, 12 inches. And, and at one point I said, well, it should, should be fun maybe to do just for a living. After two years, mm -hmm. I felt comfy. My wife, were you comfy, Chérie, when I left my job? <laughs> so this side of the shop is all optic. Grinding, polishing, figuring from six inches up to 50 inches in diameters. All the machine that you see are homemade that I build all my machinery all the testing system, all the manipulating, uh, uh, sucking cup to move the mirror around. And so now the other side is more mechanical assembling while well, the oven is there. And this is the, the kiln, my pizza oven. So inside you got, you got uh, elements on the floor, the walls and the ceiling. So it's all computer control. So on this side here, this is my vacuum chamber to do the coating. Homemade again, Homemade? yeah, yeah, because yeah. I couldn't afford to buy one, so it took about a year to build. Can I ask you, when you first took the air out of it, were you scared? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I one day I said, I gotta build my own guitar one day, yeah. and then mm -hmm. three, four years ago I said, well, let's try it. So I built my first guitar, mm -hmm. the only guitar I built. I play in open mics and everything. Uh -huh. People go nuts about the sounds. Oh wow, who, who, what kind of guitar is that? Mm -hmm. Well, I build it. Mm -hmm. Can one make me one? I said, no. <laughs> it's a very good sound guitar. Yeah. My dream project? Oh boy. That would be to have uh, a place in the Rockies for uh, my wife's horses uh -huh. and my observatories with a big 50 inch in there. And, uh, <laughs> That's my compressor. <laughs> okay, yeah, so amazing individual, right? All, the, all those tools, all that machinery that he built from scratch, you know, like, like built his own vacuum chamber for, for, for putting the, the, the aluminum on his mirrors. That's like astonishing, fascinating individual. Uh, uh, and and uh, just a, a really uh, neat example of, of some of the tremendous talent in this country for, for astronomy and, and, and the, uh, the, the, uh, the thing that we love uh, about this. So uh, I was going to show you that if you saw, remember back when I showed you the telescope museum, that one beautiful wooden telescope in the middle there, that beautiful carved wood, that was made by Norman Fulham. So we got one Norman Fulham scope for the, uh, for the, uh, uh, museum. It's a it's an eight inch Dobsonian um, handmade, all beautifully carved wood. So, uh, Sky News. I mentioned we've turned things around. We were at the 25th anniversary issue that that some of you, most of you, should now have in your hands, and uh, it's it's really been um, under the leadership of Alendria, who has just been a fabulous new editor. Um, that we're we're moving into the second 25 years, I think, with confidence and and with a sense of renewed vigor and and purpose. So uh, looking forward to see what happens with Sky News in the future. And if you haven't been to the Sky News website, do check out the website since it's been re revamped and, and changed. It's a completely different place than it used to be and has a lot more useful information and a lot more expansion on what's in the magazine. So, And of course, the Robotic Telescope Project, which uh, we're hoping to have up and running. Like, I mean, the, the scope is up and running and we're using it right now for outreach and the science team and the, and the astrophotography team are, are taking pictures and taking measurements with it right now. But we really hope to open it up to all the membership later this year 
we're just waiting on that software update I was telling you for our, our membership and online sales thing so that we can actually appropriately charge people for their time on the scope and then, and then you know, make sure that they have the permission to be able to download what they're supposed to be able to download. Um, and we just can't do that right now with our current, uh, current system. But there's the scope. That's what it looks like. It's a 16 inch uh, uh, beauty in, in uh, California in the Sierra Nevada mountains. Um, it's in this shed here, which is shed number nine of the Sierra Remote Observatory uh, up here. Um, and you can see where that is in California. It's, it's very close to the Nevada border. It's in the Sierra Nevada mountains. Um, uh, and it's uh, an area that has fabulous dark sky and very clear skies uh, for, for many, many nights of the year. So uh, very happy about that. Uh, the goal is to ultimately be able to, uh, for those of you who, who attended um, Jenna's talk on the robotic telescope uh, a couple of months ago, she gave a bit of an outline of what the program is eventually going to look like. The idea is people will be able to participate in the scope project at three different levels. There are people who just want to be able to get the data, get the photographs, and then do their own processing on the information that they're getting. And for those folks, we're setting up a pure subscription thing. Um, you'll be able to, to get all of the astrophotography and all the science data collected over the course of an entire year that you subscribe to it. And you'll be able to sit in on the astrophotography and science forums to hear from the experts their advice about what they're doing with the materials and how they're collecting it and such. Then there are people who are going to want to actually have a bit more of a driver's seat. And, and so we're going to allow for people to become members of the astrophotography or the science team. They then get to help set the targets for the year. They get to learn how to program the, the, the scope and process the, the material that's coming out of it. They'll have a, they will have access to all the data that comes out of uh, those, the two teams and, and membership in all the forums. Um, so a little bit more hands-on. Um, there are still always going to be professionals involved in helping you use the scope because the scope is very expensive and we don't want a, an individual member to feel terrible about breaking a you know, $60,000 piece of equipment by banging it into a wall or something like that, which you actually can do if you're not careful. Um, so we, uh, we're always going to have at least uh, some professional uh, people uh, helping to guide folks, but that's one of the purposes of that team member level of membership is, is the mentorship that can take place. More experienced people used to working the scope can teach newer people how to do it safely. And so eventually we build out the roster of the members who have some ability to drive the scope. Last but not least, we know there are some people who don't want to share data, they don't play nicely with others, or, or they just have some things that, are, that there are their own personal interests. And so they're gonna to wanna to be able to, to rent a little bit of time on the scope to, to gather data that suits them. Again, we're not just going to give them the keys to the Cadillac and let them drive the thing on their own. There will be a professional uh, 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 obser observation team member uh, present to help translate the vision of the person who's purchasing this time into the reality of what the programming looks like and when it can be done. And also just to, to provide a little bit of necessary know-how for folks who come with maybe unrealistic ideas or expectations for what the scope can do. You know? Folks coming in and saying, hey, can I take a shot of such and such tonight? Well, no, actually, because there's a full moon and it's right in front of what you want to look at. <laughs> um, so things like that, you know, or, or um, no, we won't point your scope at, we won't point the scope at Venus for you because it'll just burn out the camera very quickly. It's way too bright, you know. Um, so uh, that's kind of the, the plan for it. I want to just share a little bit of what's already happened with the scope. Here are some uh, things that members have been able to do with, uh, with some of the uh, photography plates from the, from the scope. Uh, right after Jenna did her talk, we released some data to the whole membership as a whole and said, here, play with this. Get a, get, a, get a handle for what it's like to process the imaging data from the scope. Do what you will with it. Here's three different members uh, uh, playing with the same image uh, from the Dumbbell Nebula, and, and you can see the very different results they came up with. I'm not sure why Steeman has his reversed, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> And then I think the thing that I'm still most proud of is Jenna's work with the high school students. These are, if you read the most recent Sky News or if you've been on the website, you've seen the stories, but these are, this is data taken of transits of exoplanets in, in uh, remote systems that um, the, uh, the students completely planned and executed. So these are, these are exoplanets that have been confirmed by these students in these high school classes. And I can't for the life of me imagine what it would have been like to have had that as a science project when I was in high school, uh, to literally be, be looking at planets in other solar systems. But here's what they're doing, and they're doing a great job with it. And it's, it's, uh, it's very exciting. And I think this is another aspect of that service to science um, uh, area uh, uh, that, that as a society we, we want to uh, promote. Because the folks who are doing this, they're probably getting their 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 um, 
their interest peaked and they may become the next generation of scientists who will, who will hopefully be the next generation of astronomers here in Canada. So I, I mentioned there'll be three tiers on the telescope. This is our, our tentative pricing structure, but again, none of this can happen until we've got the, the software in place to support it all. Stay tuned. We're hoping within the next month or two, we'll be able to announce that, that things are up and running. And so I, I just wanted to, to say thank you all. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak at your second um, virtual meeting. I know we all hope to get back to real face-to-face -face meetings sometime soon. Here's an example from XKCT Comics of you know, what I think a lot of RASP meetings are often like. And I'll just let people keep reading that as I, I wrap up here and, and say once again, thank you very much for your time and attention. Judy, you're muted right now. I can't hear what you're saying. <laughs> yes, I actually clicked on it too to unmute myself and just didn't click. Um, thank you again for, for joining us today and providing all that information. There's a lot there to digest. Um, I don't see any questions uh, there yet, um, but I had one from myself uh, regarding the national survey that you mentioned early on. Um, I'm sorry if I missed it, but do you know when that's going to be going out approximately? Sorry, the, I, 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 I was clicking off my thing. You were saying that when is what going on next? The, the national survey? The national survey. Member survey. I uh, it's 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 on my it's on me right now. <laughs> so so as soon as as soon as as soon as your ED gets it all done, it'll be going out. So I, I would think I would think uh, I would like to have it out and running before the the GA takes place. But I may I may deliberately delay it till just after the GA, so as not to, to crowd too much on once. Okay. The reason I'm asking is is that our center was about to do the very same thing for oh. our members specifically. So my so rather than our members being bombarded by two. I'm wondering, is there any way that we could sort of piggyback ours onto yours? So we, just for our members that we could get specific answers to? Let's absolutely, let's absolutely talk about that. Let's, let's make, make Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Okay, um, I don't see any other questions, anyone. Oh, one of the questions that came up early on, um, the ETU that you're giving out, we were working under the assumption it was the second edition? Yeah, this is the second edition. It looks a little yeah. different because we changed the cover. Okay. Uh, but it, it, most of the inside is the same. We, we did a little bit of reformatting and cleaned up a couple of paper breaks and things like that over the okay. former second edition. So this is kind of 2.5. <laughs> okay. And, and this, this would be sent out only to new members, not to currently no, existing. Well, we'll, 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 we'll sell it to anybody. And we'll yes. send it to anybody who wants to do the program. If people are renewing and they, and they don't have a copy and they really like one, we could be, we could be talked to. Yeah, I'm talking to shipping it to you. We're not, you know. Okay. We do a lot of people who've been around for, for many years already have a copy or it's, it's not their thing anymore. They don't need a basic guidebook like this anymore. So, so we didn't want to just automatically ship it out to everybody. Um, I do my, uh, Phil, that was my question about the ETU guide. Okay, yes. Um, the second edition, uh, I worked really hard on that with Charles Ennis when we brought yeah. that out. So when I heard rumors about being a new printing, I guess I was just interested. I, d I didn't know much about um, what, uh, um, yeah, it looks nice. Yeah. So uh, I was in touch with Charles <clears throat> the other day. He, uh, he contacted me and said, um, you know, maybe you were considering um, coming out with a third edition and doing some updates as well, or is... Yeah, we're, we're talking about it. One of the things, it's, it's a little less of a priority for us right now because we have a new book. Oh, yeah. That's going to be coming out later this year through, through Firefly Press that, uh, that we're working on that... Um, uh, Nicole Mortolaro is the, the chief uh, author on, and it's going to be, it's, it's, a, it's kind of an almanac. It's, a, it's, it's another introduction to observing, uh, to sort of, again, bridge that gap before people are quite ready to digest the, the observer's handbook. And so the question is, we're going to wait and see what that really looks like, and, and whether it kind of replaces the need for this. Or I, I still think there'll be a use for this. I mean, one of the advantages of this 
um, just from a from an ED of an organization perspective, is this is so cheap to produce because it's so small and thin and like that. You know, I can ship these out to every new member. I, we can take stacks of them to to events and and practically hand them out because you know they're they're and they're great calling cards. You know, it's a great yeah. way to introduce somebody to the society. Say, you're oh, you've been looking through my scope. Yes, you, you saw Saturn there. Would you be interested in learning more about astronomy? Here's you know. So if people are <clears throat> are buying the guidebooks, are they getting that version? Yes. Yeah. Okay. This is what you're getting now. If we renewed our, um, we buy at the center. We buy boxes of them from time to time. If we get some more in, they'll be these. Okay. So I'll be in touch with Charles because after the second edition was done and I saw it printed, I did have some ideas for a third edition and he did reach out to me. So uh, I'll talk to him about, about those ideas. Yeah, and that book is certainly being used to uh, promote the Explore the Universe certificate program and that, that was its guidebook. So yes. I think there'll still be a place for that. Oh, absolutely. And I guess one of the things we did, you'll notice we took, we took the word guide off the cover Oh, um, because we wanted to kind of bury the lead. It does on the inside still say an introduction to the RASC ETU observing program, but it's just, I was impressed when I first came to the society that this is useful for anybody. You know, if you're not doing that program. This is just a great, here's an, here's a quick, easy introduction to astronomy. Um, my staff tell me like Eric, when he first joined the society, he read this like his first week on the job and it gave him all the background knowledge he needed to get, to get started on stuff. And whatnot. So it, That's uh, great to hear, because what I usually hear are criticisms. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 know, I know there are people who, are, who, who, you know, it, it, who feel it's not everything it could be, but well, if everything it could be, it would be the, explore, the Observer's Handbook, right? Not, <laughs> yeah, well, the, the, there's a long history there, but it is what it is. Um, yeah. But yeah, so uh, yeah, I'm glad, glad for that update. Um, but we did we did do a lot of work on it from version one to version two. So yeah, yeah. and if, if we, I think there'll be a role a role for a version three of it down the road. I guess I'd be interested to see in this this other publication too because yeah, I, I want to see what this other book looks like before sure. as it comes out, and then and then we'll figure out how to how to best use version three. Yeah, I mean that book there is very much directed towards completing the Explore the Universe observing program. You know, it's very specific. Uh, but it does have a lot of general information as well. And um, you say it's good for anybody, but in fact, the Explorer of the Universe uh, Observing Program is open to everyone. You don't yeah. have to be a member. So. And, and in fact, if you, it, I'm going to tip my hand here, but my column in the in the upcoming Sky News magazine is all about that. Okay. I'm going to be talking. To, I'm going to be talking to people, the, both the both the, the readers of the magazine as well as the members, and say, look. We're all looking for stuff to do right now. We're we're all you know we're doing virtual party virtual parties things like that. I am going to commit to doing the Explore the Universe program. Come join me. Let's all do it together. And, uh, and so we're going to work through. And so I'm going to I'm going to and we'll find a way either on the website or maybe Jenna will put together some other amazing you know <laughs> uh, thing or or Eric will develop some communication thing. Well, we're going to we're going to do something about you know your dumb new ED works his way through the Explore the Universe program. Come join him as he makes all those initial mistakes and whatnot. <laughs> don't worry. Uh, I have to confess that even though I was chair of the observing committee, I didn't actually complete uh, Explore the Universe until after I had stepped down. So. Um, Judy shamed me into it. So. <laughs> well, we're, we're going to try and make this the year when we get like the majority of our members to do it. <laughs> Let's all just go out and do it. Come on. <laughs> no excuses. Well, I've done some observing. I was out, I was out uh, last Wednesday and I saw the Crescent Venus. Nice. I, 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 got a, I, I bought a scope um, secondhand over the Christmas holidays and just recently got a beautiful new eyepiece from Explorer Scientific, a two-inch eyepiece, a wide-angle one to put on it. Uh, lovely. I, I apologize for the attendant bad weather that I've caused by buying new pieces of astronomical equipment. I understand that that's the rule. And, uh, and so, well, you're new. You're forgiven. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. Uh, thanks for filling us in on that because I'd heard, I'd heard little bits and pieces about Explore the Universe guide, and uh, you filled in all the the uh, missing pieces. Right. I did get a question here privately from uh, from Blair McDonald. I know he was probably thinking I would just re reply to him privately, but I will I will reply publicly here and say, yeah, that sounds like a great idea, actually. Uh, basically, the idea about the, the virtual observing sessions that you've been doing with center members, maybe expanding that out to make them available to, to other people in the society. 
And yeah, we could probably work on something like that. I think that'd be kind of cool. And Alia, we'll have Jenna get in touch with you, but not right away. Jenna is, I've, I've got to, I've got to rein her in because she's, she's, she will, she will work herself to death. She is, she is that kind of person. Um, you know, every, every society needs a Jenna or two, but, but you've got to, you've got to then protect them because from themselves. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks so, again. Thanks so much, Phil, for, for being here with us today. And I must commend you and your staff on a job well done, given the circumstances that we're going through right now. Um, I know that personally, whenever I've contacted any one of them, they have responded well within 24 hours. Uh, so I have no issues with them. And, and given the number of people that are in the society, to get that kind of a response from them is, is phenomenal. So. Uh, congratulations on, on that and um, hopefully this will end soon and like you said we'll be able to meet face to face at some point uh, the provinces are slowly one by one you know relaxing some of these physical distancing uh, restrictions that we've had so hopefully sometime soon we'll be able to uh, go back out in the field and join each other observing so again thank you um, do the panelists have anything further to comment on? If not, we'll, we'll call it a close for today. Okay, well, thank you one and all, and thank you to the speakers today who participated. Very much appreciated. Um, this session was recorded, so it will be up on the uh, website for Halifax Center uh, fairly shortly. Okay, so stay tuned and I'll be able to, to see it. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, Judy. You're welcome. Bye-bye.